Okay. This is Terry Hibbets, and he um, got his uh, master's at Texas A&M in commerce, and he has, and that was in biology, and then he has his wildlife biology degree from Texas A&M University. But the interesting thing about Terry is he has co-authored several books. Uh, they are both put out by uni uh, University Press. Is that right? Texas University Press. Yeah, Texas A Texas University, yeah. Uh, Texas Turtles and Crocodiles. I believe we only have one crocodile in the state of Texas. Is that correct? We got we got one alligator. Yeah, we got one alligator. And sometimes they find a, uh, they used to find chameleons. I uh, mean, a chameleon, caimans every now and then. Okay. But uh, since they're illegal in the pet trade nowadays, you don't see them very, very often anymore. Well, that's good that they're not in the yeah. pet trade. The other one he co-authored was uh, Texas Amphibians. I have both of those books. Awesome, awesome. And I want to I want to mention that they uh, Terry and his wife Diana have a website. Terry and Diana's Photography and More. You all need to go to that website. It's awesome. Where is your house? Where's Where's your home my, there? My home is in uh, west of Camp Wood, which is uh, north of U Valley, about 45 miles. Is that the picture of, of your house there? Is that yeah, that's a picture of the house on the website. Yes. Oh, we built the house cool. back in 2005. We've been here ever since. Well, y'all need to go to that website. It's, it's <laughs> uh, the pictures, his pictures are fabulous. Okay, so here's Terry. <laughs> well, good morning, everyone. Uh, she, she went through the, the me stuff. So I just wanted to really thank you guys for allowing me to do this and, and hopefully and bear with me. Uh, this is kind of a first uh, attempt at doing this. I've done a couple of Zooms, but that's a little different because I just sat back and answered questions. But but here I'm, I'm going to try to go through the uh, uh, Texas Master Naturalist uh, curriculum a little bit and go through the reptiles and amphibians or amphibians and reptiles, which set, shows on my my uh, uh, my uh, PowerPoint. OK, so we'll start out um, with what is herpetology? You know, and we look at that and uh, it comes from, you know, it's a Greek word herpeton and means cream pig animal and, and, and uh, ology. Everybody who's been, uh, has some science classes in their past to know that that deals with knowledge. So herpetology is the study of, of a creeping animal and the knowledge of those animals. Well, it's not herpes. Uh, I've had somebody ask, "What? What? I thought you, this this is herpes." No, this is herpetology. Okay, so let's go to the next slide. Some of the goals that we we have in this is uh, uh, we're going to try to communicate basically the characteristics of amphibians and reptiles and and how they differ from other vertebrates. And another these these are goals that are listed now. I think in y'all's uh, uh, manual the the. Texas Master Naturalist Manual for Reptiles and Amphibians is understanding the relationship among the major groups of the, of the herps. And we I use the term herps as short for herpetology or short for reptiles and amphibians. And uh, anyway, and how they relate to fish, mammals, and birds. We also will demonstrate uh, basic knowledge of the ecology and life history of, of the herps in Texas. And uh, then we will try to outline some and communicate some of the challenges uh, confronting conservation in herps in Texas. So we're going to start out with amphibians. Amphibians, amphi, you know, means double life. So these are animals that that uh, have a, a double life in the sense that they they usually, not always, but they usually uh, spend part of their life in water and part of their life in on land. And uh, so, <clears throat> so we're going to look at some of these. There's a couple of photographs of of, uh, of amphibian. The, the, the over on the left is the uh, tadpole stage, or the water stage, and then and then on the right is a frog that is uh, developing uh, into an adult and and gradually absorbing the the uh, tail. But unlike reptiles, 
amphibians have clawless toes. They don't have any claws on the ends of their toes. Or they're, uh, if, if they've got legs, there's a couple of varieties that have uh, don't have legs, but they're not found in Texas. Um, they're thin, moist, scaleless skins. And you say, well, what about a toe? Well, a toe is still kind of moist and scaleless. Now, they may be a little bit rough and kind of warty feeling, but uh, if you ever handle one long enough, they will secrete, uh, secrete materials that make them really uh, uh, moist. And they are ectotherms. And the term ectotherm is a better word than saying cold-blooded because ectotherm means uh, that they don't may necessarily be cold-blooded. They're not necessarily cold-blooded because uh, they, they, they're, they rely on their environment for their source of their body heat. And so they could be pretty warm or they could be pretty cold depending upon uh, where, where they're at and what the temperature is outside and their surroundings. And they can regenerate lost body parts which is uh, different from uh, lizards and snakes. They, they cannot regenerate lost body parts. And they all have glands or toxins and chemical defenses. And I hate to say it this way, but all amphibians have secretions that can be uh, a problem to some individuals. And some, some of them, the toxins are very, very powerful. Uh, for example, the toad on the right, the picture on the right has showing the glands, and we'll talk about those a little bit more. But those glands can secrete some powerful toxins that, that in certain species have been known to uh, cause damage to dogs or even loss of life. And, uh, and uh, the other picture on the left shows a, a salamander with a regenerated tail. And uh, this one, the tail did not completely break off, but it was damaged and it grew another uh, spot, uh, part of a tail coming off the side, which makes him look kind of strange. Okay, let's look at reproduction. Um, now, anytime you guys have a question, uh, I, saw, uh, Mary, I think Mary Ann will uh, direct those questions to me or, or somehow we'll get those questions answered uh, eventually anyway. But uh, we're going to look at their vocalization. One thing that is, is interesting about uh, frogs and toads, and, or, and uh, basically frogs and toads, is they do have a vocalization where they call or, or uh, attract to attract uh, their mates. And uh, we have several different types here. Uh, I don't know if I can move that up or not. Yeah, there we go. Move that up. Um, Here's a, a frog over on the left. It's a, a leopard frog that has paired vocal sacs. And they really look strange. Looks like some little kid with uh, the uh, floaties on their, on their, around her body. But uh, these vocal vocalizations, uh, these sacs uh, protrude out right behind their ear, which is the eardrum right in behind the eye. And, they, the, and when they call, these sac sacs fill it with air and they vibrate as they expel air. Uh, so it, it has an interesting sound effect. And then you have some that have a round vocal sac. Uh, a lot of your toads will have a, this rounded vocal sac under their throat. And uh, then as they fill that up with air and then they it, it, and then release the air, it vibrates and causes their sound. And then we have, let's see, go down. There we go. Then we have some that have vocal sacs that extend up above their head and uh, oval vocal sacs and some toads and uh, have that type of uh, uh, sac that that extends out and then then we have some that are mostly internal this is a cricket frog uh, showing that it has a slight protrusion of the sac but uh, of the throat but some like a bullfrog they just more or less swell up their whole body and their air and they release that air and make it real uh, loud sound that they make let's see if this will work here's a couple of toads that i photographed down below my house in a little temporary pond and on the left is a red spotted toad and on the right is a gulf coast toad and i didn't try this out earlier so let's see if this works yeah there it goes it's working can everybody hear that <laughs>
Okay, so the, the, each species has a unique sound to them. And so the, the females will be attracted to those sounds. And uh, let's see to show the difference in that in the other one. Okay, that should be about through. Yeah, that's through. Okay, let's go to this other one now. So these these two frogs, the toads are actually toads are frogs, but anyway, these two are are uh, found at the same pool, and uh, but you can see that their sound is quite different. On this Gulf Coast toad, you can hear uh, uh, also a red spotted toad in the background. So these vocalizations are enable them to attract their mates. Reproduction. Uh, after, of course, after the, the male calls, uh, I was in Mexico one time and, and uh, there was a, a big chorus of toads calling and, and, uh, and, and I got close to one to see if I could get a better photograph and I nudged it with my foot and he turned and grabbed my foot. So this, just about during breeding season, anything that comes close to them, they, they're going to grab. But this one is on the left is uh, called axillary amplexus. And plexus is where they grab the, the mate uh, and uh, hold on to them dearly. And they don't let loose until that uh, female uh, starts depositing her eggs. But uh, the male is on top and the female is underneath. And, and you notice the arm is right behind the, the, the female's front arms. And then you have in, in, uh, in, in Guna, no, I can't pronounce that sometimes, but the, the amplex is where the male grabs the, the, the female right in front of the rear legs. Anyway, but, but sometimes it's very difficult. It's, the eggs can be very difficult to identify. And because uh, uh, a lot of these eggs are very similar looking. So we, we use egg masses as a better guide. Sometimes the eggs are laid in long strands. And I have a picture of that in a minute. Have long strands or in large masses or they lay them singly. And sometimes that is an easier way of identifying the, the eggs than it is uh, looking at the egg themselves until they start developing. The larvae. Uh, with external gills and appendages are most likely salamanders. Uh, salamanders uh, normally have uh, the, the external gills when they're in the, in the larval stage. And larvae without the external gills are most likely frogs and toads. In Texas, um, laying terrestrial eggs that undergo direct development is also a version that can occur we have, I have two species that are found up here around my house that uh, never go to water to breed. Uh, one of them is called a barking frog. I think I got a photograph of one later, but uh, the barking frog uh, calls from up in the canyons, up in the cracks and the cr uh, crevices and the limestone cliffs. And uh, they form a, a, a mass, a foam mass and lay their eggs and they develop through, throughout their whole development in those eggs and come out as young ones. And then there's a little chirping frog, and chirping frogs are probably, maybe, I think they're maybe found around the temple area. But chirping frogs also uh, lay their eggs in, uh, in under rocks and in gardens and flower pots and things like that. And then there are several species of salamanders that never transform into a ter terrestrial adult form. There are some uh, salamanders, like certain tiger salamanders. There's one in Mexico that's called the axolotl, that they uh, live as a, a, a mature breeding larvae with external gills their entire life. They can be in, induced to transform, but uh, uh, most most time uh, you have to do that in, as an in, induced. And out in West Texas, where there's a, a premium of water and pools and ponds you'll find ponds that will have breeding larval form and then transform form in the same pond which is makes that interesting as well for them um, here's a on the left a spade foot with an egg mass and uh, they lay the eggs in a, in a mass like so and uh, this is the, the males is on the top, still got the uh, amplexus and the female underneath. And as the female lays the eggs, 
the male deposits the sperm over top of the eggs. It's not, it's not an internal fertilization, it's external. So as she lays the eggs, sperm is deposited. And, but it's, and it's amazing that a, a high number of them do get fertilized this way because and, 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 as, as they come out, uh, the sperm is, is deposited completely. Um, oh, here's a, a mud puppy showing external gills. A mud puppy is a salamander that, that it's, it doesn't have an, a land adult form at all. And um, uh, they're, they're really interesting uh, salamanders found in East Texas. There's not any of them found in our area. Okay. Let's look at some of the, the taxonomy of amphibians. Um, we divide them up into three groups, the codata, which is the salamanders, anura, which is the frogs and toads, and and uh, toad-like frogs and frog-like toads or whatever, but they're all frogs, an area of frogs, and, uh, and there's several different uh, kind of varieties of those frogs. And the, the uh, gymnophonia as uh, Sicilians, which are found, the northern range of those is in uh, about mid-Mexico uh, south into the tropics. And then there's some over in the old world and uh, uh, tropics in, in some of the uh, old world area. And those are really interesting. Some of them uh, look what, like worms and act like worms, but they are amphibians. Okay, so let's go through some of the salamanders. Uh, some of the salamanders first. Uh, in Texas, we have uh, two types of tiger salamanders. We've got the barred tiger salamander. We've got an eastern tiger salamander. And uh, the temple area, uh, Killeen and, and Belton area is kind of on the, in the mid mid range of these two things, uh, the eastern and the, and the barred. And uh, sometimes you'll find them uh, uh, kind of look barred and some will look eastern, but they're very difficult to find nowadays. They only breed in fishless ponds. And uh, anybody that has a pond, uh, one of the first things they do is put fish in them. And so uh, they don't, they just don't do well. The little eggs get eaten and uh, the little tiny larvae that get eaten by the fish. But these are one of our larger land living salamanders. They'll get up to about uh, 10 to 12 inches long. And uh, interesting animals. They, they, I've had, I had one in captivity for 16 years. They, they have pretty long lived for an amphibian. Um, then you have your spring salamanders, and you guys are probably real familiar with those because they're found anywhere from Georgetown, uh, Salida, all the way down into the Austin, down to San Antonio, and in through the, uh, any spring areas in, in the hill country. And they're very difficult to separate from one another. A lot of times they're, they're only identified by where they're found. And there are certain things that they have done with them. There are some DNA things that they have done with them that it does separate some of them, but they're all uh, basically when you talk, talk about spring salamanders, they're, they're very, very similar. Some of them are cave dwellers. Some are uh, found at the headwaters of springs and they don't really, very rarely survive very far downstream. Like, like at San Marcos, for example, if you go to the, the spring uh, springs in San Marcos, you can find them uh, coming out of the springs, found in the algae at the spring head, but downstream, you can watch fish that are lined up around the spring and those fish are uh, sitting there getting the larvae, I mean the salamanders, as they accidentally come flushed out of the, 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 uh, the, the exit part where the water, the springs are, are coming out. And then we have uh, uh, salamanders that are called newts. And uh, in East Texas, the eastern half of the state, we have one and then that's called a, a red spotted newt. And then in uh, South Texas, in the, uh, down in the uh, Rio Grande Valley area, you have one that's called a black spotted newt. And these, these guys, uh, they live uh, uh, a life, they, they lay eggs in the water, just like uh, most salamanders do. The eggs hatch out, they transform into a land living stage and it crawls out on the land and they call that the F stage. And then it will uh, uh, gradually uh, mature and then go back to the water and goes to another transformation to be another uh, water living uh, salamander for the rest of its life and lays eggs. 
in our hill country in uh, in the Edwards Plateau, uh, again, these things are found all up and down the escarpment uh, from, um, I think there's a couple records from the Georgetown area. Uh, I don't think it, uh, there may be a record or two from the Fort um, Fort Hood, but but mostly they're found in the the cliffs and the uh, limestone outcroppings in in the, uh, all through the es escarpment around the Edwards Plateau, and they kind of make a loop around uh, as you get to San Antonio you turn and found in the the southern edge of the the plateau. In other words, where there's a lot of moisture in the rocks and the cracks and caves and and uh, there's a lot of moisture. They call them slimy salamanders for a reason too. Um, if you try to pick one up, they will slime you. And uh, they they secrete this slimy material that that you can't wash it off with soap and water. You have to let it dry and then you peel it off. You just kind of, you have to peel it off your fingers and your hands. But uh, it, that's a, a defense mechanism. And it, it does give a, a really bad taste to animals that try to eat them. Another real interesting salamander is, uh, these get quite large, um, is a siren, uh, the Texas or Western lesser siren. Um, they only have two front legs. If you look right there, they got the two front legs. They got external gills. They have no hind legs. They almost look like an eel, um, but uh, they live their entire life in water. And when they're, they're born, they, they're, they're, the features are a little bit more exaggerated, but they don't change much after birth. They they just get bigger and bigger. Uh, there is a farm in the South Texas in the Rio Grande Valley uh, that gets much larger than the ones in the East Texas. But and uh, and they probably probably close to the Temple area. I know they're just east of there. But they get up to oh, 14, 15, 16 inches. Okay, let's look at frogs now. Like I said a while ago, toads are nothing more than just a, a specialized toad, I mean frog. And uh, we'll look at some toads first. This is a green toad. They're found throughout, uh, uh, oh, they're pretty much throughout the western half of the state. I guess you could draw a line down. I-35 is a good boundary line sometimes. Uh, there may be a few things that get cross over and a few things that, you know, either direction from east to west, but it seems to be a pretty good boundary line because it's also the boundary for the escarpment. But green toads uh, are, are a plains type animal. They like uh, prairies and open areas. You won't find them in the cedar breaks, but uh, these guys are not very large. They, they get maybe two inches from snout to vent, and uh, the vent is uh, what I'm calling where the anus is. And uh, but uh, they have these large parotid glands behind the eye, and uh, they're uh, they're uh, really vocal when when they're breeding. But you only see them a few times a year when when it rains a lot, and they'll come out and breed, and and, and then they disappear back in the ground and bury up. And the Gulf Coast toad is the one that, well, sometimes we I wonder if it's a it is an invader. And uh, years ago, it was not found this uh, very much further north than uh, oh, probably the Austin area and so forth. Now it's found all the way up to the Oklahoma border, and it may be found in Oklahoma now. But these guys occupy almost any kind of water, um, backwater pools around uh, up and down rivers. They won't be, they won't steal water, but. Uh, ponds, uh, temporary ponds, permanent ponds. So they have uh, encroached upon some of our native species, like the Houston toad that you probably all heard about in the in the, the uh, Bastrop area. But uh, these guys are they get they're about probably our second, maybe our third largest toad, and uh, they they eat a lot of insects around our place. But it's just that they have displaced some of the, our, our more uh, other toads, and they've done it on their own, basically. But Texas toad, and this is one of them. I, the, you know, I don't find as many Texas toads as they used to. Um, find them basically uh, I thirty five west, but uh, they're they're kind of a drab toad. They're not real distinctive. Telling toads apart, you have to look at uh, there's a these uh, crest on top of the head, 
and the glands, the shape of the glands, and of course, then their pattern too. But the Texas toad is uh, uh, one that has also has numbers of uh, shrank in the last several years. Uh, and I, we don't know exactly why. I don't know if it's because of the Gulf Coast uh, uh, overtaking them in their breeding locations or what, but we just don't know. We haven't had enough research to really find out for sure why they, they're declining in population. They used to be extremely abundant in uh, uh, West Texas. I uh, used to find many, many of them, not much anymore. Red spotted toad. Now this one is not red spotted, but uh, uh, a lot of them will have a red spot on each of these little warts on their back. They have a circular parotid gland, uh, min a minimal uh, gland, uh, red ridges over there behind their, on their head. Uh, but uh, anyway, these guys are about three inches and uh, they like the, the limestone uh, country and uh, they will be found further west and sometimes further north in the limestone but but they do like uh, those type of areas and to breed and pools and so they're not affected as much probably by Gulf Coast toads as the others uh, see if I, I think I got a picture of a red spot there's one that's got showing the red spots and it's the same species but like I said sometimes the, they'll that's why they were named red spotted toad because many of them had these little red spots all over their back. Okay, let's get to the frogs. We call this a Great Plains narrowmouth toad, but it's really not toad. It's got no, there's no warts, no skin. Uh, that's kind of rough feeling. Uh, these are little tiny frogs. They get about, oh, an inch, an inch and a fourth or an inch and a half maybe, um, but they're, very rarely sim on the surface, uh, but after a heavy rain, they will congregate around pools, temporary pools, and, and also uh, ponds, and they will make a sound like a sheep, and it was just kind of a, like that kind of sound. <laughs> Sorry about that. But anyway, they uh, uh, have some unique features. They've got this fold right on the back of their head here that goes across, real tiny mouth, and they're they're uh, they like to eat termites. Uh, they eat uh, ant eggs and and uh, interesting uh, uh, relationship with tarantulas. And a lot of times you'll find a, a, a female tarantula on a hole under a rock, and there may be two or three of these under that same rock. And the tarantula leaves uh, leaves them alone. And the, the of course and these guys are happy to be there, but but they remove uh, some of the things that might harm the trench, like certain ant, ant eggs, ants, and things like that, but really interesting little frogs. Uh, here's the one I was talking about a while ago that, that breeds up in the hills. It's a, it's a uh, barking frog. They get up to the size. They're not as big as a bullfrog, but they get up to five uh, inches, four or five inches from snout to vent. From here to here, and they they uh, quite interesting in that they call in the spring. Uh, they start sometimes as late as late January starts calling, and uh, and they will call every night that there's a kind of a warmish, humid, real humid. They like the humidity, and uh, so they they will call and uh, and uh, from the cliffs all around my house, and I hear them up there. I've only gone up and tried to locate them once because, I mean, I'm getting old and it's hard to get up and down those, those uh, uh, cliffs and the, the steep embankment that they're found on, up in those rocks. But uh, they'll call, and then when it cools off a night or two, they won't call. Humidity drops, they won't call, and then they'll start calling again. They'll call from anywhere from late, like January to uh, uh, March. Now, in the desert southwest, I'm Big Ben and, and uh, out in that part of the country, they, they, their calls are associated with also humidity, but that usually means rain. And, and uh, when rain occurs, they'll find it. And these guys out there, they're a lot of times are found in uh, ground squirrel and uh, uh, pack rat nest and, and, uh, and uh, kangaroo rat nest uh, and where they live during the daytime or at, at when it's dry. But barn frogs are really, really interesting animals. 
Here's the other one I was talking about, the chirping frog. There's uh, three species of chirping frogs in the state. Uh, the real grand chirping frog is expanding its range. It used to be only found in the valley, and now it's found all up and down the coast. Uh, they're really common in the Houston area now, and probably due to the plant trade, uh, they'll, they'll they'll hide in the the mulch and the the uh, you know pots of plants, and then they show up. And they're they're also one that does not require they don't re, re, reproduce in water. Uh, they lay a mass of foam and then lay their eggs in that, and they develop through it. They go through their whole development. Uh, but anyway, in your area, the cliff chirping frog is found in the uh, outcroppings and the, the real grand chirping frog is usually found in the towns or in the cities nowadays. But anyway, they found them as far north as Fort Worth now. So Then we got chorus frogs. Chorus frogs have a lot of noise. They, they, they're, really, they're really loud for such a small frog. Uh, the spotted chorus frog is the one that's the most common one in, in our area. And uh, uh, they get to be they're about an inch, maybe a little over an inch in, uh, from snout to vent, from, from you know, the snot to the vent. Uh, so they're not very big, but when that when it does rain uh, uh, quite a bit and you got standing water in the roadside ditches even, uh, they will show up and uh, apparently you say, where in the world they come from? Uh, they they were underground or hiding up into a, in a, a crayfish hole or something for a while, and then when it rains, here they come out and start singing. But uh, and the choruses can be quite loud. And then the cricket frog is probably one of the most abundant frogs in the state. They're found in nearly any kind of water, almost all kind of water, uh, creeks and rivers and streams and lakes, and and they're the ones that sound like. Uh, uh, rocks clanging together and uh, click, 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 and they're, and they're you know, kind of get a lot of them going at once and uh, this it gets pretty loud, but uh, one by itself is not too bad. But these are these vary in color quite a bit. They you anywhere from brown, some of them will have a green kind of a greenish streak down their back. Uh, that, my one of my sons found found one a population of them where they were almost solid green like almost like a green tree frog and which was kind of unique and uh, so but most of the time they're just kind of a, a, a kind of a tannish brown color and uh, the the cricket frogs they are related to the tree frogs by the way they there are a type of tree frog and they do have some pads on the ends of their toes so they can hold on and grip things too okay here's some tree frogs a couple of varieties that we have we have, you have both of them in, in your area, the green tree frog. Um, these guys get about three inches from snout to vent. And the gray tree frog, it's a little bit smaller, not quite the maybe three inches, uh, maybe two and a half to two, three inches maybe. But uh, the green tree frog, these are the ones that sound kind of, if you get a big chorus of them, sound like a, a ducks, uh, if you get a bunch of them, or maybe dogs barking or whatever, but uh, they're, uh, they get quite loud and they're found wherever there's a lot of vegetation in, in uh, lakes and ponds and but uh, you don't you don't normally find them in rivers but uh, where they're, wherever they're, you have some backwater areas that have a lot of vegetation especially things like cattails and reeds and rushes and things that, that they they can cling on to and and uh, sing from or call from and uh, but anyway they're one of the they're they're one of the I think prettiest frogs in the state and and uh, also one of the best camouflage where they're where you usually find them. Sometimes they'll be out taking pictures of things, and they'll be in some brush or in a in a some a lot of green vegetation in a, a pond, and be looking around, and all of a sudden, whoop! There's one. Oh, there's another one. So you know, it, they're they're pretty cryptic in their uh, coloration, and so are gray tree frogs because they like to hang out on the trunk of trees, on the branches, and and on the limbs, and and uh, and when they're calling, they're they're pretty much this color right here. But when they're during the daytime, a lot of times they will have a greenish color to them as well. And these are the ones that have a trill. It's a kind of like that. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> my noise is not that great. But anyway, then we get to a different kind of frog. 
uh, these are spade foots. And these are ones that, that do have, uh, with toads, you know, some of the toads are pretty toxic, the, the glands, but these secrete uh, some secretion on their whole bodies. And uh, these things can be uh, pretty uh, uh, irritating, I guess the best word to use. I picked up one one time and put it in a jar and take pictures of it later. And, and, uh, and you know, I didn't think anything about it. And, uh, rub my eyes and then my eyes just set on fire so uh these are two that you got to be careful with and there are certain species of snakes that will eat them that it doesn't bother them but uh but anyway the the spade foots are called spade foots because they have a large uh, bony plate on their high on their heel of their hind foot and they use that to dig backwards into the soil and uh, these are like a lot of times one-time breeders and there are certain uh, species in East Texas that ranges all the way probably to, to the mid, mid, middle part of the state, like Temple area, that's, uh, that comes out after a certain rain. And it, what's, what's strange is they'll call after some rains, but not uh, after other rains. And, and why, I don't know if it's the first rains uh, that, are, that are, have the right humidity and the you know, right temperatures, then they may call. And uh, they're quite loud too. If, and by the way, there are places on the internet if you want to hear more frog calls, uh, you can go to the internet and, and bring up uh, frog calls. And uh, there are several sites. I didn't put them down here, but uh, because they change from time to time, I used to have them on, on my list. And then and, and the next time I checked them out, it was gone. So, but anyway, there are sites that you can listen to more uh, different frogs and the, their, their, their calls. That, that would be a whole nother kind of course in itself. But this, the one on the, on the right here is a, a male and this is a female. So they do have sexual dimorphism in their coloration on the, this particular species. And these species, they, these are, uh, have been found in uh, uh, the temple area. I keep saying temple. I know some of you guys are from Killeen, some of you from Belton and, and surrounding areas. But anyway, I, I just, temple, just think, I just think of that in my mind right quick. <clears throat> there is a book, I think it's Reptiles and Amphibians of Arkansas, that they have a CD that comes with it. We had thought about putting a, a, a CD with our book, uh, Texas Amphibians, but we decided it was the uh, Texas Press said, that, yeah, it's too expensive, so we didn't do it. Uh, another type of frog that some of these are very difficult to distinguish is the leopard frogs. Uh, since there's uh, three species in the state and they look very similar, a uh, little bit differences in their call is the main thing, and uh, a little bit difference in their banding on their legs. Uh, some of the spotting may be a little bit different and then some of them have a, a spot in their uh, tympanic membrane, which is an eardrum, and some of them don't. And so it's just this what, but the most common one in probably temple area south is the Rio Grand leopard frog. And then from uh, uh, just east, uh, west of temple east, there is one that's called the southern leopard frog. But uh, anyway, these these guys uh, uh, have a really uh, chuckle. They have a chuckle when they call. It's kind of interesting call. That's uh, what I ought to do is go put up the call with each one of them. Huh? All right. Go we'll start with reptiles. Uh, do we need a little break at this time or do we want to just keep going? Uh, there has been a lot of discussion about frogs and toads and okay. all sorts of things. Uh, Terry, but I, I don't think I have actual questions filled down okay. that haven't wow. been answered. So uh, looks great. Your pictures, your pictures are great, by the way. That's really helpful yeah. to see them. Yeah, it does, it, it does help to see these things. And I was going to tell, tell them at the beginning. Another thing is when you go out and do presentations with groups, it's always nice to have a few things to show. Them. And uh and I, when I do uh, live presentations, I like to try to bring a snake with me or something and, and show, hey, when you have something, a, a snake to hold up in front of the group, that will get their attention. <laughs> so you, you you have passed around a snake at our training before. Yeah, I've so, done yes. before, yes. But, well, if anybody uh, but does have, 
before Terry moves on um, out okay. of frogs and toads, if, uh, if anybody, salamanders, if anybody has a question, just unmute and go ahead and ask now. I actually do have one question. I've always heard that uh, the difference between salamanders and newts was that uh, salamanders had a, um, that their, their first stage was in water and their adult stage was on land and newts were the other way around. Well, the, the, newts, act, the, newts, the newts actually go through three stages. They go through a larval stage in the water, transform into a land stage uh, called the F, and then they come back to the water and transform again into a breeding uh, salamander with, with, a, with actually a fan, on, a fan on its tail and so it can swim in the water better, and then even different color coloration. I should have had a picture of one of those, but I've got pictures of them on the website if you want to look at the the spotted newt, the the East Texas version. But uh, I didn't I didn't put that on this one. Uh, if I put all of them on here, <laughs> we'd be here for days. So, <laughs> but anyway, yeah, that that's that that is a little bit different in, in the newts. That, of course, there are some newts that are pretty toxic. And our newt is not real toxic. It, it you don't want to put it in a uh, jar, if you catch one or whatever, you don't want to put it in a jar with other salamanders because they will die. Uh, I, I, I made that mistake one time. So you don't want to do that. And then, of course, there's one out in California that's been known has has, has actually caused death in humans. So um, so they are, so the land form particularly is quite toxic, some of them. Uh, I hope that answered your question. <laughs> Yes, Doc Fowler here, um, and I'm just wondering if you if you seen a Fowler toad, no kin, uh, around this area? Or are they mostly East Texas? They're East Texas. Uh, that you're you're too a little too far west for them. Um, that has been a toad that's really been under debate over the last several years about is it really a subspecies? Is it its own species? Is it the subspecies of the of the uh, uh, the one is found in the eastern United States, or is it the subspecies of the Woodhouse's toad? And then uh, there was a guy several years ago that made it a species of its own. So that one is still kind of up in the air with exactly what that thing is in East Texas. <laughs> Sounds like the same talk in the community about me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> well... <laughs> Yeah, I get I get those things too. <laughs> All right. But any anyway, other yeah. questions? <laughs> All right. All right, Terry, head on. Let's let's go into reptiles in. <laughs> some of the character, you know, sometimes we even wonder sometimes why do we study these two together? Because a reptile is actually closer related to a bird than it is to an amphibian. So, but anyway, that's that's the way herpetology is. So we, we lumped those together years and years ago and we still got them together. But uh, reptiles have an amnio egg and that, that means it's got an egg kind of like a, a bird egg. It's, it's got all the, the features, all the ingredients, all the layers pretty much the, of a regular uh, egg does. Uh, those that, that lay eggs, even the ones that don't lay external eggs, they usually have eggs that form inside of them, except for uh, a couple species like garter snakes. Uh, they have epidermal scales. What's what? Y'all remember what fish scales are? <laughs> but anyway, most fish, uh, fish scales are not epidermal. They're more dermal, I think, because uh, most of them, not all of them, but. The eggs uh, usually, if they have legs, they usually have five digits ending in the, in a true claws. Um, you notice I said if they've got legs, because some don't. They are also ectotherms, and that may be one of the reasons they, they lump them reptiles and amphibians together, because they're ect ect ectotherms, whereas birds are endotherms. But uh, anyway, uh, they they depend upon the, the surrounding temperatures, just like the amphibians do. And that's the reason you sometimes you'll see a snake crawl out on the road during a, a cool day and he'll set uh, also hit that pavement and say, oh, wow, this feels good. And he just sits there and then he gets run over by a car. But anyway, 
but they're actual therms and, and they do depend on that and they will go come out and bask and and and, uh, and uh, set in the sun and, and warm their body temperatures up uh, some snakes uh, some of the water snakes will when they they get parasites or get uh, ill or get problems with their uh, their digestion or whatever they'll come out and bask in uh, some of the hottest conditions sometimes which is really strange they have a, a, respir a respiration system, and I probably didn't mention that with the amphibians. <clears throat> I should have. Uh, respiration in amphibians is uh, got triple type re uh, respiration. They can breathe through uh, sacs, air sacs, which are kind of like lungs, or they are lungs in a sense. And then some of them breathe through their skin, don't even have any lungs, don't have the air sacs. Some can breathe uh, through the, the lining, the cutaneous lining in their mouth and their cloaca. So salamanders and amphi uh, amphibians are a little bit different in that. Respiration, reptiles have really well-developed lung or lungs. Uh, most snakes uh, have uh, uh, one well-developed lung and one vestigial lung. Uh, pythons and boas have two well-developed lungs and uh, lizards have uh, well-developed lungs. And they have copulatory organs. In other words, for breeding, they have an organ that is inserted into the female to uh, release the sperm into the female. <clears throat> so let's look at some of these things. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, reproduction. <clears throat> reproduction in, in uh, lizards is really interesting. And also in some of the snakes is really interesting. Uh, this is a green animal. Most of you are familiar with those. They're, they're, there's one of these animals that has also uh, done well with human habitation because they have been transported around the uh, United States with, in flower pots and so forth. But they will, uh, uh, and anoles have this dewlap, and he'll use that dewlap to attract a, ma attract a mate, or he'll use it to say, uh, you know, I've got a better dewlap than you. In other words, it's a kind of a combat uh, thing between two males sometimes. So, but so it is used in, in courtship and also in uh, uh, territorial disputes sometimes. And other lizards like this tree lizard that you have around y'all's part of the world too, they're found all through the hill country. But the tree lizards uh, will uh, fill it with air and they will also uh, fill up uh, the, the dewlap. Will, they have a small dewlap and their belly is usually blue and some of them have a reddish belly but but anyway the, the this also is a, more of a territorial thing and also it can be a courtship thing too and in snakes uh it's particularly noticed in in rattlesnakes and, and cotton mouths copperheads will go through this uh, uh combat dance uh, what they call these are both males and uh, there's there's a female probably nearby. I didn't actually see the female nearby, but uh, got these in, in combat. And these are these come up quite frequently, especially if you're in an area where there are a lot of diamondbacks and you're out a lot in the field. Uh, some you're going to see this ev eventually, sometime or another, if you're real observant. But uh, they will uh, throw body uh, the their coils over each other and push each other down and. Eventually, one of them tires out and crawls off, and then the one left behind is she, it gets the, the female. But anyway, but it's a real interesting experience if you have never got to witness this. It's a it's real interesting to watch that. Uh, but that's another uh, it's a courtship and uh, I guess territorial thing as well. Again, and then. Uh, on the left shows a pair of anoles actually mating. Uh, the male makes sure that the female doesn't get away. He uh, bites her on the back of the, the, the nap of the or neck and grabs a hold around the body and then twists his body around to insert the, the copulatory organ inside of her. So this is uh, uh, interesting. If you haven't seen that, observe that. You know, it's uh, something you you know, maybe you have to be 73 years old to be able to observe that. But anyway, that, that's one of the things that's real interesting to find something like this occasionally. Box turtles. Um, when I was growing up, I used to uh, 
kickbox turtles. That was one of the things that started me and got me interested in when I was about, oh, I don't know, seventh grade or something like that. That's when I started. But uh, we got we get these box turtles and and uh, they would breed and the males would uh, hook on with their hind legs on the on the carapace of the female and uh, and uh, the the males have a curved in plastrum on these box turtles and then that way he could he could reach the the cloaca of the female. Now they, so this is another uh, this is actual copulation type and in in uh, Water turtles, uh, they they do this out in the water. And uh, if you haven't seen the courtship of water turtles, that's an interesting sight as well. Uh, usually, a lot of the water turtles will come face to face and do these little dancing things in front of each other and face to face, and then and then he'll finally come work his way around the back. And uh, on the turtles, a lot most times males are much smaller than the fem the females, but due to the fact that they 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 need to uh, be able to reach the, the cloaca. So taxonomy. Uh, by the way, the, the snakes do the same thing as those lizards do on uh, copulation. They they twist up around each other and in, uh, in, uh, so he can insert the his uh, copulatory organ. You know, uh, snakes are unique though. They have paired copulatory organs. And they're called hemopenes. And uh, but he only inserts one at a time. He don't insert both of them. And then there's spikes on it too. So it's kind of hard for the female to pull loose. No, that's probably more than y'all wanted to know. Anyway, <laughs> uh, turtles, we got lizards and snakes are in the same group. Uh, they've got sub two subgroups with those and the crocodilia. And then you got the spinodontidae, which is the tuatora, which is found in New Zealand. And that's the only only representative of that group. <clears throat> Excuse me. Okay. So we're going to start out with turtles. Um, soft shell turtles. We have um, two species in the state. Uh, we've got a smooth soft shell and a spiny soft shell. And the spiny soft shell's name because it's got spines right here on the, the carapace right in, behind the neck. And they, these little spines kind of they give it its name. Um, there are varieties of these in Texas as well. Uh, I don't I don't really separate them out here because they all look very much alike, and uh, sometimes it's difficult to tell apart. Uh, but if you look at the, the the map or you look at the a website or whatever other websites, uh, you can see uh, some differences in them. You know, slight differences in them. Now these guys, the females get large. Um, I don't have a picture of a female, but I've seen females uh, 18 inches in diameter, which is, you know, that, that's big. And uh, the males are much, much smaller, uh, very rarely over, you know, uh, eight or nine inches in diameter, so maybe a little bit bigger than that. And uh, these guys also uh, have a snout, uh, the snout, so that way they can they can sit in the under on a, in the muddy water or on sand and the shallow water and kind of bury themselves up and and then all they have to do is raise their head up just enough to get that snout a snout right here above the the water surface and they breathe. So sometimes they may only stick just the tip of their nose out of the water, so it makes it difficult to see them. Uh, but uh, these guys are uh, can also be quite vicious. You don't handle them. Uh, or handle them extremely carefully. You got to hold them from the the back, the back end, the back end of the shell, because that neck comes out pretty far. If you grab them right here in the middle, he can reach around and bite you. So uh, you got to be real careful of these. And these are basically aquatic turtles. They very, very rarely come out on land. They do come out on land to lay their eggs, though. So, uh, but uh, you look at their their feet. They're really. Uh, Extremely webbed, hind feet even bigger and, and highly webbed. They're very fast in the water. Tortoises is a, a turtle. These are turtles also, but it's a, a, a tortoise is a type of turtle. And uh, these are South Texas animals in, in Texas. They're from probably San Antonio South. The northern part of the range, their population is probably going down a little bit. I need to set up a little bit more in here. The population is probably going down a little bit. 
in the northern part of the range due to development and and maybe over collecting or maybe the, there's so many roads out there now too that they, there are a lot of them getting hit on the roads but uh, they're still fairly abundant in if you go further south into the big the big ranch country uh, they're 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 still quite common down there but these guys um, very rarely even drink water they don't really have to drink water if there is not enough vegetation around they can get a lot of their moisture from the the plants that they eat now that doesn't mean that they won't drink when they come across a, a rainstorm or a puddle they'll stick their head in and drink 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 for a long time but uh, they don't have any you know they got their feet are i don't know kind of like elephant feet they're not they're not any webs or anything they're strictly land animals got powerful claws on the front for digging holes they'll dig a, a hole that's uh, uh would sometimes ri rival a uh, armadillo and uh, they'll li live in those holes and, and stay out of the heat and then during the early mornings and early, late afternoon they'll come out and feed on on vegetation but they're they're veggie strictly vegetarians i guess uh, young ones will probably uh, venture out and eat more a variety of things uh, a lot of young animals uh, like birds you know might be seed eaters, but as when they're babies, they'll eat whatever their moms give them. But uh, anyway, but these guys, they'll, they'll, the biggest one I've seen probably, oh, I don't know, what's that, about you know eight, uh, tie, nine to 10 inches or so. Um, but uh, they got this uh, scoop uh, underneath their chin. It's a fork. I don't know if I got a picture of that or not. No, I don't. But anyway, they got a fork uh, uh, underneath their chin that, uh, uh, they use males combat. They'll come together and face, and they try to flip the other one over with it. And uh, if they flip one over, then then that other one can go uh, uh, on its way, and the other one takes a while to flip himself back over. He will flip himself over eventually, but sometimes it takes a while. Mud turtles. Uh, mud turtles are – it's amazing where they're found. They can be found out in the deserts of the southwest, and you say, where in the world do they live? But they can live in a, a – tank or stock tank that is dry and they've buried up into the mud and then when you get a good rain and it fills up then they'll come to the surface and feed and breed and do all kinds of stuff sometimes they'll travel across land trying to find better sources of water and, and if they get caught very long out on land you know in the heat or someplace sometimes they it will they will die and they'll succumb to it but but the yellow neck mud turtle they're i don't know they're not the prettiest turtle in the world they're kind of drab they do have a, when it sticks its head out, uh, they do have a yellowish, uh, some yellowish markings on its neck. But other than that, they're pretty, pretty drab. But they're found, you have mud turtles all over the state. But in East Texas, you've got a, the Mississippi mud turtle. And in the West Texas, you've got the yellow neck mud turtle. A little bit different. They're a little bit different and they act a little bit different. Then we got regular old turtles. This is called a Texas cooter. And this is found in, these are found in the uh, uh, Brazos River system, uh, the Colorado River system, and uh, in the, the, some of the streams that come out of the hill country, like the Sabinal and the, uh, Medina, and, and I've never found one in the New Asis, though. But uh, they're found in the, all the rivers that come out of the hill country, and also uh, the, the Brazos and, and and then in East Texas, you have a version that's found in, uh, throughout East Texas, and it's more diverse and found in more different habitats, whereas the Texas one is found just strictly in rivers. And then there's one in the Rio Grande Valley that is the best looking one. It's really pretty. Uh, that's found only in the Rio Grande River and its tributaries. Um, another turtle. This is another, it's kind of sad to me, uh, box turtles, the Western box turtles. Uh, I want to know how many of y'all have seen those recently in Central Texas? That's what I thought. Probably not very many. Somebody many has a question on that. I don't know, but they they are a grassland species, and our blackland prairies are not the best shape in the world. And they used to be really common in the blackland prairie, and then also in the Fort Worth prairie and the Grand Prairie and the, all the the grasslands and the and the uh, hill country and especially in the northern edge of the hill country they even made it down into the northern part of the Edwards Plateau I mean the northern part of the the brush country 
and they went all the way as far east in, into the sandy country in the post oak belt and east, uh, east Texas. And uh, I don't know, I, I, they're just not as near as abundant. They, they're long lived. They reproduce only uh, when they reach a certain age. Uh, I don't remember what that age is. It's usually maturity. When they reach maturity at probably 10, maybe less, uh, 8 to 10 years old, maybe, maybe older than that. And they only lay a, a few eggs at a time, and they may not lay every year. And so recruitment is not great on these turtles. And uh, but anyway, they're still very abundant in the panhandle up in the high plains. And uh, there is also good populations of out, out around in the Marfa area and with a, a Western subspecies out there. But it's, it's just something kind of sad. All the box turtles in Texas are, are hurting right now. That's another thing we can talk about, too. Uh, conservation. Then probably the most common turtle in Texas is the red-eared slider. This is one people ask all the time, what turtle is this? And I said, does it have red on its head? Yeah, well, it's a red-eared slider. And then, but thing is, sometimes these will become melanistic as with age, and that red mark right there will become black, and uh, all these yellow marks will be uh, dark, and it just be like a black and white uh, or black and gray turtle. And... Uh, and, but uh, anyway, this is a young male, I think. It's got long claws on it. Turtles, a lot of these water turtles, the males have, will have long claws, and they uses those not for digging, but uses those in courtship with a female. Um, and then, the, of course, you, they, uh, well, I don't know, of course, some may know this, but do you look at the tail to tell the difference between males and females. The, the male has a very large, long tail, uh, the reproductive organs are, are in the in at the base of that tail, and the females have a short kind of short stubby tail, and that's basically true with uh, some of the other reptiles as well. But these turtles are, you know, in Europe they'll say you're 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 importing all these turtles over here, but these guys don't have a problem over here, but they're having a problem in Europe because uh, people are buying them and releasing them, and they're they're now they're found in a lot of places like Spain and France and Italy and some of their ponds over there. <clears throat> and there's even some ponds in South America that have red-eared sliders now. All right, let's go look at lizards. This is one of my favorite groups. My two sons have, uh, wrote a book on this. I didn't. I wasn't involved with this book, but they wrote a book on this, and it's, it's a, called uh, "The Texas Lizards." And this was the best-selling book of uh, of uh, the three that we put out. We put out one on the amphibians. We put out one on the turtles. And this one right here on Texas lizards. And this one is out of print from UT Press, but you can still pick it up. Uh, I think there's still some available in uh, in places like uh, uh, on uh, Amazon.com and also in some of the bookstores. Have them. Okay, lizards. Uh, my son at AM, this is his specialty. He, he does research on lizards, and I may mention him later, but anyway. Uh, we're going to look at these. Uh, we say, well, lizards have legs. They have external ears. No, not always. This is a Texas spotted whiptail, and I refuse to call it the Western spotted tip tail uh, whiptail. That's what I naturalist is calling it, calling it now. Um, and I don't know why they changed that name, but because that right there to me, this is this is a Texas. I mean, they're found in New Mexico, but this is a Texas animal, and it's. You know, this distinctive, and I like that name best. But anyway, but this is a male, is an orange throat, blue belly, very, very kind of much more buckier uh, head, and, and so forth. So, all right, here we go. We got this one. It's called six line race runner. This is a a prairie animal. It, it likes uh, the prairies, open grasslands, sandy areas, and you can find them both in in proximity to one another, but usually not exact same habitat. These like more open, grassy, uh, open you know, sand, and you know uh, sometimes they look gravelly back there, back there. But it, but the, they're they're uh, patterned differently, and they have only six stripes on their back instead of seven, and they'd have no spots whatsoever. There are some species. Let me let me go back a second. Let me go back. Go back to the previous. 
There are some species of these that are unisexual, and that's another whole big lesson right there on, on unisexual lizards. There are several species around the world that are unisexual. Uh, that means there's no males. They're all females. And uh, there's uh, one along the Rio Grande River that uh, is, is uh, called, uh, I don't know, it's a Rio Grande uh, <laughs> whiptail, I guess. But uh, there's one, there's a couple out in West Texas. There's one called a Rusty Rump. There's one that's, that's got, called a, uh, uh, well, I'm thinking of the scientific name, El Chihuahua Desert. And then there's one out around El Paso. And then once you get out in the desert southwest, there's a few more varieties. But they have no, no males. If you do find a male, you got something very, very, very unusual. Um, but anyway, uh, the, they took them a while to figure out how in the world they breed. But there's a whole papers and papers written on them now on how they, how they reproduce. And we could get into that, but that would, you know, we'd be here forever. So... Let's go into this one. This is a Texas banded gecko. They're not too far from y'all. They're, they're mostly in the western edge of the hill country. Uh, these are small lizards. They, they only get to be about, oh, four inches long. Uh, notice the tail is very uh, large compared to fat, thick. If you get one that's got a skinny tail, that means they're, they're malnourished. The fat, they store a lot of their fat in their tail. And of course, when that tail breaks off, uh, they grow a new one, but uh, they, they grow, you know, I saw a while ago that uh, reptiles don't regenerate. Well, it's not, uh, the tail can regenerate in lizards. i sorry about that. Snakes don't regenerate anything, but the, the, the uh, lizards can regenerate their tail. Um, this one has eyelids. Uh, it's got external ears, but but these are real, uh, you say, how can, uh, they look so fragile, how can they survive in some of the areas that they survive in? But they come out at night, they're a, they're a night lizard and kind of like your Mediterranean geckos that are found in your around people's houses nowadays in cities all through Texas. Um, and those things are now, you know, abundant just about everywhere. But these guys are, are really uh, interesting lizards that come out at night and they're, they will have an eye shine to it. Now. Then we have a group of lizards that are called earless lizards. They have no external ears whatsoever, no opening. They have a few a bone or two. Some of them have bones, uh, 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 inner ear bones, but they, they're not well developed. And uh, this, is, this is called a greater earless lizard. They they're should be fairly common in uh, uh, river beds, uh, rock rubble, uh, hillsides that are just solid limestone. And, but... Uh, they the, this is showing a lizard basking and uh, this lizard can withstand tri quite a bit of heat but he still doesn't want his feet to get really hot look at those feet look at the toes uh this one is just on his on his claws uh, just about not hardly anything else is touching right there a little bit of foot touching in the back he's just got his heel touching he's got his legs raised up and he's got his body raised up off the off the rock so this way he's uh kind of passively uh uh, uh, drawing in the sunlight, but uh, not too much. This is a male. The males have uh, the distinct body markings like this, and the female might have just a little bit, but not, in, but not the colors that this this uh, uh, male has. Some of these lizards like this, you know, you thought, said the tail will break off and regenerate. This is actually a regenerated tail right here. On the tip of this lizard. This is a female of the same of the same lizard, and uh, and it's, it raises the tail up and waves it, and uh, that way, if a predator, especially like a bird, a roadrunner or something like this, would you know, see that tail wiggling, they'll go grab the tail. Tail breaks off, and lizard runs away and hides. So a lot of times he'll wave that tail up like that to, to uh, say distract. It would distract the the uh, predator. Terry, I'm going to interrupt you. Um, so an ear, an earless lizard, do they sense sound in other ways? Yeah, they through their body, uh, most, mostly through their body. Uh, in other words, if you're walking out there on that ground, they can pick up those vibrations like a snake does, and they'll either freeze in space or they'll run off. So, yeah, so they, they can still pick up uh, 
uh, the sound, the sound, but, but it's through the vibrations that they pick up through their their legs and their body. But uh, but anyway, but they there are seven. And this is the spot tailed iris lizard that is in. Uh, my son is doing studies on this guy, and uh, the populations have crashed, especially in south uh, southern part of their range, and in the northern part of the range, they're finding them. They're they're uh, they're doing better. But uh, they've got a whole. I've got a whole thing on these uh, information on these about their conservation that I may bring up later if we have time. But anyway, but these guys are under a, a lot of scrutiny right now. Uh, Texas has put out some money, some grant money, and and uh, some of the universities are are doing different kind of studies on these guys right now. And a lot of the ranchers are not going to be unhappy too much with these. It's not like the golden chick where you have to require a. a you know, a certain amount of juniper and whatever. These guys do best on uh, areas that are highly disturbed. And so uh, some of your ranches that may be overgrazed, that this will suit them just fine. But that's not the case as much as it used to be, I think. But anyway, burn burn regimes too. They like uh, areas that have been recently burned and they'll, they'll multiply very quickly. Most, a lot of these lizards too are short lived. And this lizard, particularly, two, three years, maybe max, and it's mature in a year. Uh, so, you know, when the eggs are laid, uh, we found some babies the other day that were a half an inch long, and uh, three of them at one place. So that means they recently come out of eggs and that were in the ground. And anyway, the they they will by the end of the summer they will be uh, breeding size and will be able to breed first thing uh, when spring hits. And they do, they do breed in the early spring and lay their eggs, but uh, they're just a real short-lived lizard, and that and that's one reason they're easier to have problems with animals that are that that have that kind of a life history. There's a baby one, little bitty thing, just hatched out of an egg. Then here's another one. I don't. I want that. Uh, that's something I want to ask you guys. Be thinking about this. How many? Cod lizards have you seen in recent years? Um, I know they're still abundant in certain areas, but down here on my place, I have seen one in 15, 16 years. And, uh, and they used to be abundant all through the hill country. And uh, the eastern cod lizard uh, in Oklahoma, they call this a mountain boomer. It doesn't make any sound, though. I think they're some kind of frog or something that they've heard. But uh, these guys uh, uh, really hot uh, nature. They like it really warm, and uh, they can run on their hind legs with their front legs extended, kind of like a dinosaur. And uh, but of course, some of those whiptails can run on their hind legs, but they don't look like they're running on their hind legs because they're still parallel to the ground. But this one will raise up and run. But uh, the collar lizard is is. Uh, used to be an icon in wherever there was a uh, rock outcroppings. And I know in uh, the Atlanta uh, uplift uh, around Mason and uh, uh, Lano and, and some of those areas where they have that the, the big uh, uh, granite limestone hills and rough places that I think they're still fairly abundant there. But in other areas, you just don't find them as much. And I just want to know how many of you guys just think, be thinking about that. How many of you guys have seen them here recently in your area? Skinks. Skinks, there's a group of uh, lizards that are called skinks. They're uh, smooth scaled. Their scales uh, do uh, slightly overlap, but they're, they're when you go uh, rub your finger down their back, it's real smooth and slick. There are several varieties in the state. This is called the Great Plains skink. It's found uh, in the southern part of the Great Plains uh, from uh, probably, I don't know if they're found in Nebraska, but they're found in Kansas all the way down into Mexico. And there, this is our largest skink too. These guys will get up to 12 inches long. And uh, <clears throat> when their babies are jet black <coughs> with some, <coughs> excuse me, with orange on their lips. And then as they mature, they they lose that black color except for but kind of between the scales <clears throat> but um, these guys are uh, very uh, secretive they're found in the rocks and, and uh, uh, mouse holes and 
and uh, they tunnel under the ground pretty pretty easily. Uh, and even in rocky areas, if they can get under the rocks, then they can t tunnel down into, under the rocks and get into an area where they can be protected from uh, the heat. But uh, they're they're a pretty interesting lizard. They do have external ears and, and uh, everything normal eye, eye lids, just like most lizards do, except for a few. All right, Mediterranean gecko. This is one I was talking about a while ago, uh, sometimes called a house gecko. This is one that showed up in Texas around 1955 or so. And now it's, uh, and it's you know, along the coast. Uh, I don't know if the first ones were in Brownsville, I think. And uh, came in uh, from the Mediterranean area through uh, potted plants and so forth. And uh, now, I don't know if, if, that's, if I'm telling the truth or not, but I would venture to say they're probably in every little town, every little city, every city in, in, in Texas now. Uh, they even made it, I think they're making it in, all the way up into Oklahoma. So they, they can withstand freezes really well. Um, during this last freeze we had, people have said they, they found they found some babies. And I said, huh, well, that's interesting. But the thing is, they, they reproduce in the walls of houses a lot of times. And they'll lay their eggs in the walls and they'll hatch. And, and the babies will come out to where it's a little cooler and not go out to where it's really hot. So, but the Mediterranean geckos are... They have no eyelids. Uh, there are certain geckos that don't have eyelids at all. This is these are the ones you've seen photographs probably of the, of their tongue coming out and and uh, licking their eyelid, their eyes, so that they get the debris off of it. <clears throat> they do have external ears, but they they're they're no eyelids. And there are several type of geckos that that uh, uh, don't have eyelids, and there are some more that are showing up in Texas now too, along the coast, uh, particularly if one in Houston, and there's a couple of that have showed up in the Brownsville area. Then we have this group of lizards. This is a lizard, it's not a snake. Uh, it's called a slender glass lizard, the Western slender glass lizard. It has external, it has external ears, it has the eyelids. That's what typical lizards have. He also, if you go down to where the anus starts, uh, the cloaca or whatever the starts which is somewhere right in here somewhere right in there um, uh, that then there are some internal uh, vestigial uh, remnants of a of a girdle but they don't uh, they of course they're not external at all they're they're legless and these uh, uh we people like to call them grass swimmers because they swim through the grass uh, when they get into a grassy area, they can just go back and forth across the grass and not even touch the ground. They're, they can really move. Crossing the road, though, is a different story. They they look like they're something out of place completely because they have a hard time crossing a, a paved road. But uh, we have the, these guys get up to oh, three feet long, but most of its tail, this tail has been broken off and it's just started to regenerate. And uh, that tail would be Oh, that thing would be a whole bunch longer than that. Regenerated tails don't nearly get as long as the others, but it's difficult to pick one up because when you pick one up, they thrash around and they break that tail off, and that tail breaks off. They're hoping the predator will grab the tail and leave them alone. But I don't know if they're thinking that or not. But that's that's part of the process anyway. <laughs> <clears throat> One of our favorite lizards, I guess, and uh, one of the ones that started a lot of stuff on conservation of, of uh, reptiles and amphibians. Been protected in the state for a long, long time. And, uh, but uh, the Texas horned lizard, we have three species of horned lizards in Texas. Uh, all three of them are protected. The round tail horned lizard is found in, uh, in the Stockton Plateau, in other words, the western edge of the uh, Edwards Plateau and in, in, out into the Big Bend country. And the Texas horned lizards used to be found statewide, believe it or not. Uh, they were found in the sand belt through the, some of the areas in East Texas, wherever there was uh, deep sands. Actually, wherever there were forest uh, harvester ants, uh, native, <clears throat> you had uh, these guys that were associated with those harvester ants. But uh, now, uh, east of I-35, there's only a few places in Cameron County that still, I think, have these. There may be a few other places, but that's the only ones I've seen uh, reports on is in the Cameron County area. But uh, out west of I-35, 
uh, around towns and cities where there's been a lot of uh, poisoning of ants and fire ants, and then of course that kills a lot of harvester ants. Uh, yeah, used to take the babies out, yeah, release them. But uh, these these guys are are uh, uh, still fairly common in, in South San Antonio in the brush country, and and you get out into the the high plains and certain areas out there, they're still very common. They're still real common out in the big men country, and they do squirt blood. Uh, some people say, "Oh, that's a myth." No, it's not. It's happened twice to me. Uh, once I picked one up off a road and handed it to my son in the car, and when I did, it squirted blood all through the, on the roof of the car, or inside of the roof, and that took a while to clean all that up. And it sprays out of a, a pore uh, near the eye, and it, and it usually sprays backwards because that's what grabs them. You know, it's the back, and so it, it sprays this way. And you can see the spray marks on his fingers. This was my son I grabbed this, and when he grabbed it, it sprayed backwards on his fingers. And uh, but anyway, it does it does happen? So, but I, I've personally I've never experienced it recently or whatever. You have to provoke them pretty good to get them to, to do that. If you were a dog, I bet they would do it. Another one, Texas spiny lizard. A lot of people call in and say, I got a horn lizard. No, Texas spiny lizard. They have uh, spines, uh, the, the scales on their back are end in a point, and they and if you go go down their back, you don't feel those points, but you come back against that grain, and it's uh, uh, really spiny and really rough. These guys get up to about 10, 12 inches. I don't know if I've ever seen them in quite 12 inches, but uh, between 12, 10 and 12 inches, and they're pretty big, and you find them on trees mostly, uh, fence posts, people that's got yards, even in some of the cities that, that haven't got too many cats, uh, that's another story, cats, but uh, uh, cats would decimate lizard populations. <clears throat> but anyway, uh, these guys, uh, uh, fence posts in areas, and but areas where they have cleaned up their yards to the point where there's uh, not any uh, habitat for them, then they, they disappear. But but these, uh, these are egg layers, and I keep mentioning that uh, most lizards are egg layers. There are a few that give live birth, but uh, most of them are egg layers. Here, here is a, a call a crevice spiny, and that the far as far east as they get is in the uh, the Mason area, the uh, Lano uplift, uh, and and all that granite country. They are found there, but they call them crevice li uh, lizards uh, for a reason. They have the spines like the Texas spine does, but they like to live in crevices and, and cracks and, and limestone outcrops. Very wary. Uh, you approach one, if he sees you coming 100 yards away, they'll disappear in the crack. And uh, But uh, they have to get accustomed to you in, in the area before they will kind of sit there and wait for you to get close enough to them. But uh, anyway, they, these are our fire really close to you and where y'all are, where you, your group is, if you go over the, the Mason area. Then we have the fence lizards. This is another type of spiny lizard. And these guys don't get about six to seven inches long if the tail has not been broke off. And uh, the males are got uh, really are really pretty, and then they got the the reddish, rusty, orangish head and black throat and a or, uh, blue belly. <clears throat> a lot of these lizards that have the blue belly and the color is a uh, they they would use this in display for courtship. And also for uh, uh, territorial disputes, too. They'll raise up on their hind legs and do push-ups, even. There's the underneath. So that's quite, uh, quite, quite a knockout compared to the back, and the throat patch, and the, the, the black, and the, the blue on each side. All right, snakes. Now, the uh, lizards. Mostly are lay egg layers. Most snakes are not most. I'd say the majority of the snakes are egg layers, but there are a few exceptions. Uh, a few lizards will lay uh, have eggs, and if you were to cut a lizard open, that you know I don't like doing that. But if you were to cut a lizard open, and uh, and I've seen them splattered on the road, and and they would have the uh, a cover a sheath around each baby, which would be an internal egg. 
It's just that they hatch on the inside and give, give live birth. Snakes, uh, though, they have a, a good amulet egg. Uh, nearly all of them, even the ones that give live birth, will have an amulet egg inside, except for, like I said, I'm going to tell you a minute, garter snakes. They're, they're, they're quite a bit different. Uh, but anyway, this is an Arizona elegance. I did my master's thesis on this guy. It's a glossy snake. These, uh, they look kind of like a bull snake, but they've got smooth scales. They only get about uh, three and a half, maybe four foot, uh, but that's really un, un, unusual, a four footer. And they like sandy country. They're found in the brush country in South Texas really abundantly. Uh, they're found through, from uh, the, the Carrizo sands that run up in East Texas. There's uh, some been found up and down that, the Carrizo sands. And then they're they're found in West Texas, scattered in populations where they do bury or can tunnel into the in the in the dirt or the soil. Mouse eaters primarily, they will eat lizards, but they're primarily mouse eaters. Used to be one of my favorite snakes, uh, and a lot of people like them. Uh, they, the, they used to be protected in the state. They're no longer protected now. Now they're protected from commercial sale, but they're not. Uh, protected for catching one now and then bring it in and doing demonstrations with and so forth. I wish I'd found one. I'd brought one in and showed it to you, but I haven't seen one lately. Um, but the indigo snake, this is documented as the largest uh, non-venomous snake in the United States. Uh, the indigo will eat anything just about. We found a baby, box, uh, baby uh, tortoise in one one time. Um, this uh, we, the snake we collected the snake and it got too hot and it threw this baby turtle up and when the snake didn't die we let it loose later but it just uh, it got too hot and too uh, I guess like when somebody gets really hot and, and they 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 can't keep their food down or something but anyway but these will get up uh, I have actually seen them one that was eight feet long. Uh, there is records a little bit over that. Uh, there's, I don't I have ever seen a record up to nine feet, even though some of the locals down there say, oh, I've seen them 12 feet. Well, if they, if I ever saw one 12 feet and they caught it, they would uh, probably get rich. But anyway, the Indigo's, uh, uh average probably six feet. And, uh, so their, their average size is bigger than nearly any other, any other species of snake. Bull snakes average probably a little less than six feet in most of the state, but well, I got a picture of bull snake in a minute. But I don't know, do I have a picture of that? Yeah, I got a picture of that. Look at that. Let me get that, move that over here. This is my oldest son. This is an eight footer that we found on the side of the road. Took pictures of it and then let it go back on the side of the road where it was. But uh, they do get quite big. And they're usually once you catch one, they're they're uh, they're a snake that that uh, are usually pretty inoffensive once you catch them. But the, in captivity, I didn't like them at all. They're nasty. They they're they're cleaning up their cages was not fun. Anyway, <laughs> this is a Great Plains rat snake. I may be getting too comfortable over here. I hope I don't go to sleep talking. Uh, Great Plains rat snake. Uh, this is these are found. Mm, kind of spotty all through the state. There are areas where they're more common in other areas. In the hill country, they're pretty abundant. Uh, they're, they're one of my favorites. I uh, used to keep one in my classroom when I taught because they, they were always nice. The kids could handle them and they, they didn't bite. And now I'm not saying when you pick one up off the ground, it's not going to bite you because they probably will. But, but usually after they've been in captivity for a while, they, they really calm down and become really a nice animal to display and show to to uh to your uh, people that that are your audience there you go your audience the great plains rat snake now I mean, in south texas they get up to five feet long yep yeah i just found find one at miller springs that's probably definitely i want to go to miller springs by the way i want to go chase dragonflies there anyway uh the uh, uh these guys uh, one in east texas is darker and got checkers on the bottom and the ones in the hill country got small uh, checkers the one in south texas have a white belly and but the ones in south texas get five feet long and ones in hill country are very rarely over four feet texas rat snake chicken snake this is the one that everybody loves to hate 
because um, they do get they get up pretty big. Uh, the biggest one I've personally found myself was seven feet. Um, the uh, average is probably more like five, five and a half feet. But uh, these are the ones that if if you're in an area we've had somebody said the other day, if you're if you find a snake in the most unusual spot there is, it's probably a Texas rat snake. Because they will get in, they they climb trees, they can get up in the walls, and get in the roof, and get in the attic. They uh they can get in the uh and get in the basement, they can get in your garage, and get in the chicken pen, and you know they're they're search, searching for mice, searching for food, and if they happen to get in a chicken pen, they'll eat baby chicks and eggs as well. But so this is one that is uh you know beneficial most of the time, but you just got to learn to fix your chicken house that where the snakes can't get in and out of it. But that's, that, that is difficult because these guys can get into almost anything, but uh, they don't calm down very well. I've never had one. Oh, well, I can't say never, but most time they, they will bite incessantly all the time. You pick one up and he starts biting. They, they're just uh, not a, they're not, not a real friendly snake. Now, of course, when you get bit by a non-venomous snake, it's going to leave a lot of teeth marks. A lot of, uh, 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 you're going to get a lot of blood surfacing on your skin, but uh, it's going to be uh, it's going to be interesting. Yeah. <laughs> Some of these th when these things come up, sometimes they come up so fast I can't read them fast enough. But anyway, uh, <clears throat> but anyway, these guys are are uh, really not statewide. Uh, through the northern part of the hill country and the southern part of the hill country and the escarpment and the southern part starting in about Kerrville, a little west of Kerrville West, there's another variety that's called a Baird's rat snake, and they've got stripe down their back and their, their skinnier belt. But uh, then these guys are found, they kind of wrap around that, that species, and they're found up in the, in the not in the Great Plains, but they're found in the, the Mesquite, no, no, wait a minute, I'm still, yeah, the, the Mesquite Prairie. Well, well, I will not get a doggy door. <laughs> yeah, that might be a good reason. My neighbor had called me the other night and said, I got a snake in the house. And I had to go over and get it out. And it, it was a it was a rat snake. It wasn't this one. It's the the bear's rat snake, which is found up where I'm at. <laughs> Hogno snakes. These are uh some of the most favorite snakes of people. Even though some of them are patterned like a copperhead, this one's not particularly. But uh, if you look at a hognose snake and you look at the snout, they've got a snout that's slightly turned up. Now I'll have a picture, a closer up picture of one here in a minute. But the hognose snakes are, have an unusual habit. And uh, when you find one, uh, this is a dark one. They vary tremendously in pattern. This one is the what you call the water snake. Uh, mimic or the cottonmouth mimic pattern, and uh, you can see the snout on it pretty well. And then here's the mouth open, and they will open their mouth and spread their neck out like a, a cobra. Uh, my dad always called them spread natters, and they're they're uh, they have these enlarged teeth in the back of their jaw, and uh, they use that to, for two things. They do. They are slightly venomous. I have never heard of a human having a problem with one, getting bit by one, because they don't bite very often. But but uh, they they will deflate toads. They're primarily toad eaters and frog eaters. And they use that snout to dig in the dirt and looking for, the, for their food. And then if this doesn't work, if this, this tactic doesn't work to bluff their prey away, then they'll roll over and play dead. <clears throat> they'll hang their tongue out of their mouth. They'll open their mouth. They'll even uh, have saliva and foam will come out of their mouth. They'll extrude stuff out of their cloaca. And uh, anyway, their anus back there, they just, it just, they look like they're dead. And if you take him and roll him over, he'll roll right back over. And uh, so, and it takes a while to get photographs of these guys. You have to get them, for a while and take them and take, work with them because every time you try to take pictures of them, they'll play dead and it, you don't want a dead picture of them all the time. <clears throat> There's two types of hog noses. There's a Western hog nose and an Eastern hog nose. The Eastern hog nose is the one that most often does the uh, uh, ritual of playing dead and, and, uh, and, and 
bluffing. The Western hog knows will some, but not like the Eastern. Here's a night snake. It's a small species that gets very, really rarely up to 20 inches. I don't know what the record is, but the very rarely, I, I have never seen one probably over about 12 to 15 inches. But the night snakes, now we talk about venomous snakes having uh, elliptical eyes. Well, a night snake has elliptical eyes, but it's not, uh, uh, well, okay, again, it is one of those that has a, a certain amount of uh, toxicity to it. So uh, in its rear fang, it doesn't have real true fangs, but but uh, it can cause uh, some uh, damage to a lizard enough that he can get it down without the lizard running away. But, but uh, no one has ever been in problem with. There we go. There's a picture of the eye. Really neat looking eye. And so it's not only the big, big venomous snakes that have elliptical eyes. There's also a few uh, ones that are not considered dangerous to humans have elliptical eyes as well. Milk snakes. Uh, there's uh, probably three, maybe four subspecies of milk snakes in Texas. There's a new paper that just came out that, that separated some of them into their own species, which I don't necessarily agree with. But anyway, this is the Mexican variety that's found in South Texas. Their much pattern is much more distinctive than the, the other milk snakes in the state. Uh, and again, I will show you a venomous snake in a minute that, that kind of that this guy mimics a little bit, but it's really not a true mimicry because he doesn't have the exact same uh, pattern, and we'll look at that in a minute when we get to the venomous snakes. But milk snakes uh, get about a little over two feet long. There are some that maybe get up to three, but uh, the, especially the ones in South Texas get bigger than the ones in East Texas and the ones in West Texas. And then you got the king snakes. We have uh, uh, king snakes in the state. Uh, we got in East Texas, it's the speckled king snake. And then in uh, central Texas, we have a combination. It looks like a, a combination of the speckled king snake and the desert king snake. But uh, these guys, they call them king snakes because they are immune to venomous snake bites. And uh, if they find a venomous snake that they can swallow, they'll, they'll eat them. And uh, of course the indigos will too. And racers and coach whips will eat other snakes too. But, but these guys are pronounced, I mean, they, they like snakes and they'll go after a snake anytime they uh, get a chance. I um, learned my lesson very quickly as a teenager. I had a one cage and I caught this uh, king snake, put it in the cage. Well, there was a racer, uh, a blue, uh, a yellow belly racer I had in the cage as well. And I came back later that afternoon, and that racer was in the belly of that king snake. So, anyway, they they will eat things that are as big as they are. Texas thread snake or blind snake. I still like calling it blind snake. They're not truly blind. Look at the the you can see tiny eye spots on a, that are covered with a scale. Of course, the eyes on the other snakes are covered with a scale, but it's just uh, transparent. Transparent. This one is uh, uh, more translucent. It's the scale is a little bit thicker and the eyes are not as well developed. But the, the thread snakes, they're, they've, with a lot of the range we've had lately, people have been seeing more of these. And uh, the, you can, it's hard to tell sometimes the difference between the head and the tail. And, uh, but uh, anyway, they get up to about, oh, maybe nine, 10 inches. Um, really big one out in West Texas. There's a one that's called Transpecus blind snake that gets bigger. He's darker in color. But anyway, these guys are uh, have a tendency not to uh, fire ants. Don't bother them because they they go into the a fire ant mound and they'll go in and eat all the they'll eat eggs and uh, the fire ants don't seem to bother them. So they their uh, fire ants uh, have been really probably beneficial to this guy, but not necessary to us. Coach Whip, uh, this is, uh, these guys vary tremendously from one region of the state to the other. They get quite large too. They'll get up to six, six feet long and and they're very, very quick, very fast. They call them a whip snake or a coach whip because the tail end particularly looks like a braided, old-fashioned braided whip. Uh, and uh, 
they're they're non-constrictors. They have to chase their food down. The, the reason they got the, the big eyes, and uh, they they you know hold their eye, heads up and look and watch and see if they can see something, and then uh, they'll chase it down. Um, and now I didn't say anything about that tongue a while ago, but I'll, I'll say something about the tongue now. Um, the tongue of snakes is very very sense. It's their sense organ for two things. Uh, for tasting and smell. Uh, how in the world does it smell? Well, as it flicks its tongues out, you know, the Jacobson's organ, it flicks its tongues out and brings it into an organ in the roof of its mouth called the Jacobson's organ. Somebody mentioned that a second ago. And uh, and then that those uh, particles then can be transferred into the Jacobson's organ, which will be recognized by the brain of you know what it is or something that it doesn't want to be around or wants to get away from them or Whatever, and then of course you can even pick it, pick up uh, some uh, taste and stuff with it too a little bit, but not as much. It's more for male than anything. But whip, uh, these guys are also there's a whip snake we have that's very closely related. That has got stripes down its back, and uh, I don't know if I got a picture. Yeah, I do have a picture of that one. Have remember from remember which which ones I got pictures of. Whip snakes found throughout the Edwards Plateau, and. Uh, these guys are even longer and thinner and skinnier. And I got the privilege to actually hold a six footer the other day. And it was amazing uh, that I, uh, that snake uh, that long and been that much of a tail. And, but uh, these are primarily lizard eaters and they will eat snakes. They will eat mice. They will eat birds. But, but they're, they're, uh, when you're looking at an animal that primarily depends upon its sight, it's going after things it can see. And it can then chase down. I got I got pictures. Uh, there you go again. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> but uh, they 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 guys uh, are really uh, uh, really good at uh, observe. I've got one down in South Texas several years ago that, that I watched actually chase down a lizard, catch the lizard, and I, I got pictures, series of pictures of it eating that lizard. And, uh, and it was kind of interesting watching that process. Water snakes, one of the most maligned snakes in the state because everybody thinks if it's in the water, it's a cotton mouth or a water musking. And uh, I don't know, the term water musking I guess, uh, is a bad term anyway. But anyway, this is a diamondback water snake, probably the one of the most common water snakes in the state. Anything, if you got a water, you got a lake, you got a stream, you got a, a creek. And they usually don't find them in uh, small ponds in West Texas, but you'll find them in ponds in East Texas. But uh, water snakes, we'll look at some differences in them in a minute, but uh, they, their eyes are more set on toward the top of the head. Uh, they got banding on their on their lips or their scales on their, around their mouth and um, the labial scales. Anyway, they got uh, those. And anyway, then also they do not have a pit between the no nostril and eye. And they got a round pupil in their eye. But of course, you, people say, well, you have to get close to them to notice that. <laughs> well, you do have to get close to them to notice some of those things. But the pattern is so distinctive, though, it shouldn't, you shouldn't have any problem with the pattern on these guys. Uh, there is a, other varieties of water snakes, but uh, I didn't, I didn't, you know, put them all on there. If I put every one of them on there, you know, we'd be here forever and we may be too long already. I don't know. But anyway, bull snake. It's one of my favorite guys. Uh, they're the ones that are big bluffers. That's where they get their name, bull snake. You know, some snakes get their name from what they eat. Well, a bull snake doesn't get its name from what it eats. I'm sorry to say, <clears throat> but they they uh, do get, get quite large. <laughs> <In a minute. laughs> but anyway, these guys uh, uh, <laughs> will uh, eat. Uh, all kinds of rodents, um, even some of them will eat uh, young rabbits. Um, they've uh, get quite large. The biggest one I have found it was uh, 102 inches, which is uh, you know pretty good size neck. <laughs> it's over eight feet, but uh, they they get especially in the valley they get big and uh, they they will eat large meals. And uh, if you keep one, have one in captivity, try to feed a small meal, you won't even eat it. So anyway, they're they're got a real big snout, a rostral snout that for eating and uh, and uh, <laughs> but anyway, 
here's here's what the, you usually see him when you confront one. They'll he'll open his mouth and he'll hiss and blow and and he's got the, the epiglottis with a little a piece of a tissue that goes across the middle of the epiglottis. And when he blows air, it will sound have this rattly sound to it. And so a lot of people will confuse these things for rattlesnakes, even though the head is not completely not shaped anything like a rattlesnake. And uh, but uh, anyway, they they will do this. And well, sometimes they will bite pretty bad. And uh, even as adults will bite bad. But but they are extremely beneficial snake uh, in, in, on, on, in our landscape. A long nose snake. It has an extra scale in between the, the nose and the eye, and it makes the nose uh, snout look a little bit longer. But it's another one of these that has got a, a more or less a confusing pattern. When they crawl, it makes it more difficult to see these snakes crawling with this, this disruptive pattern that they have. <clears throat> and I think that's really the case with the uh, coral snake and the uh, milk snakes as well. And instead of mimicry as much as it is a uh, a, dis a disrupting pattern as they move and crawl. These are al almost primarily lizard eaters. Another one, lizard eater, patch nose snake, probably the most common snake I have on my property. The patch nose snake has a, a, a rostral scale on their nose. It's quite large. It's used for pushing its way up under rocks and uh, under boards and limbs and uh, under areas to searching for lizards. And they are constrictors. They will constricted and a lot of people will confuse them for ribbon snakes but these guys are are dry animals that live in the open areas and the rocky outcrops and i see more of these on the road going from my house to town than i do anything else they get they get up to about three feet a little over three feet long ground snakes um, the baby, baby copperhead no not a baby copperhead baby copperheads are patterned just like the adults with ground snakes, they're, they're, they're small, they, they get about 10 inches long, and they vary from one part of the state to the other. Uh, and so in my area, most of them look like this photograph here. In some areas, you'll find them, they'll, they'll have a, a darker head with a faint stripe down the back. In some areas, you'll have bands out, out in the Big Bend country, you'll have a lot of them will have bands. And in, in some areas up in the high uh, plains or in certain areas, uh, the, uh, but uh, anyway, these guys will have a, a, a be reddish colored with dark bands. And then in some areas, you have a, a, a kind of a broad stripe down of, of, of each side by, by uh, side. Been a lot of people try to do some research on these guys to find out, you know, if there's just certain conditions, why they have these patterns differently. But but uh, but you'll find all three of these sometimes in the same all four of these sometimes in the same area or all five of these. Yeah. You know and sometimes in the same area. Flat-headed snakes. Uh, Flat-headed snakes are one, uh, also one of our smaller snakes, except for one species out in West Texas. But uh, they have a dark head, and the head is flattened. And usually they have a reddish belly, or, or kind of a red part, uh, streak down the belly. A lot of them do. But uh, uh, they're, they're a centipede, a spider, uh, they eat things that we don't think about too much that snakes eat. And then, uh, but they're, they're usually really secretive and very really difficult to find. Usually after rain, so you'll see one on the surface, but not very often. And, uh, here's a plains blackhead snake. Another one that's, uh, got a, a really much darker head. And they barely make it into uh, probably down around Abilene and uh, that area. They're, they're more of a the big rolling mesquite prairie area north. Garter snakes. And I was mentioning garter snakes. Hey, yes, sir. Before you go forward, what's the best way to tell a, a flathead snake from a ground snake? Since there's so much variance in the coloration. and Well, you, you almost have to pick it up. And once you look at uh, the uh, the head, the shape of the head, uh, you can see that it's, that it's been flattened. And usually the flat-headed snakes, even the one that, that has a, a lighter head is darker. But uh, like I said, though, some of those ground snakes have a dark head too. But uh, the scale pattern on the back, uh, the, the ground snake, the, the, it seems like the scales are more 
uh, intricately patterned down the back or, or set on the back. Um, let me see. Let me if I can go back a few a couple here. Previous. Previous. Okay, look at the scale pattern on this one. And then look on the scale pattern on this one. They're, they're just, a, there's things about it. The head is much thicker and head of uh, uh, broader. They're, they're usually bigger. They're usually fatter, uh, more bulky snake. And it's just, it's one of those things too. You, you have to, it's an experience thing a lot of times uh, to be able to get to, to know just by sight which one you've got. A lot of times on this species, I have to pick it up because this one does have a red uh, red um, stripe down its belly. Whereas ground snakes, none of them have red on their belly. Okay. That, that's, that's, that's one of the things. This one has red. <clears throat> Thanks. But anyway, yeah, it, it, that is a difficult one to separate. Um, but then usually you can find them under the same rock sometimes too. Uh, garter snakes, um, big group of garter snakes. Now these are live bearing. And as I mentioned a while ago, the, the garter snakes are a little bit unusual. <laughs> uh, we've got too many snakes in our area. <laughs> but anyway, th th these guys are live bearing and they uh, they have a, a, a actually a, a almost like an umbilical cord and uh, the, egg, the egg sac or the case is not fully developed around the baby as it develops, but it does have the have that uh, uh, sac. It, it's almost like a placenta. It's not, but it's it's just uh, it's different. It's different from any of the other uh, live bearing snakes that that give live birth, like the water snakes. It's the internal eggs, and these guys have have actually a little tube that leads to a, 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 a not a placenta, but it's a, an attachment to where the eggs would be and, and uh, get their nourishment that way. But anyway, checker garter snakes. Uh, well, they're also all the garter snakes are really neat snakes. They're, they get up, you know, two feet long and uh, they're life bearing. And here's a ribbon snake. These are found throughout the hill country. The, these are like found in the water and around the water. And when they, when you flush one, it runs into the water and tries to get away from swimming. Whereas a checker garter snake is usually found near moist, damp areas. And also found out way out, out in open areas, but you usually find them after rains and so, so forth. But anyway, these guys are primarily frog eaters, worm eaters, um, salamander eaters, um, and, 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 and they will eat minnows. The same with the, the guard, other garter snakes. Some garter snakes will even eat mice and lizards. But. Okay, let's go to the venomous snakes now. Y'all about, about had enough of all those guys. Uh, Texas coral snake, uh, they're, they, they're found in your area. They're found pretty much, uh, oh yeah, venomous species in Texas. <laughs> okay. But anyway, uh, uh, these guys are really the most common snake, venomous snake I have in my area. I've been, I've been in my area for 16 years. I've seen two of these, one dead, one alive. I have not seen any copperheads. I have not seen any diamondbacks. I've seen one, a uh, couple of dead ones. And uh, none of the other type of rattlesnakes in, in, in my canyon, in the Oasis Canyon. And I've talked to people that have lived here all their lives. And for some reason, you just don't see very many down in the canyon here. Uh, coral snake, uh, they're very secretive. And uh, they will see them out crawling in late in the afternoon and morning. Now, here's that milk snake again in comparison. Look at the head. Um, the head is shaped quite a bit different. Uh, the look at the banding here you got red and black this one you got you got red and yellow there is some black there but that's because there's a lot of black in the, the red scales in the texas in the eastern united states and you know, the one in found the west you don't have all that black in the scales but but the, you know you don't that old saying red and yellow kill a fellow uh, uh, red and black venom black black that's not good on that's not not even completely good in texas or in the united states you need to uh there are some coral snakes in south south america that are completely different and there's some uh, other animals too that are different but, but anyway so that, that does give you a little perspective on on the differences that here the the coral snakes have fixed fangs in the back of their in the front of their mouth they have fixed fangs that are in the front they're just not very long and um 
and then some people say they have to chew on you. Well, if it's a big crawl snake, he don't have to chew on you. He can just bite you, and it, he'll inject venom into you. Uh, they're the most venomous snake drop for drop in Texas, but it takes a maximum dose to d- kill a 150-pound per- person, and uh, and the maximum doses are very rare. Uh, you know, It only takes, I think, one milligram or something like that. And that's about the maximum dose that they can uh, inject. So it is it is toxic. It's just that they they're a lot of times they're not big big enough to give you a really good bite. Or if you get a really big one, they can and they can bite you anywhere. They don't have to bite between your fingers or whatever. They're not that small. They can they can open that mouth pretty big. So don't handle one. Copperheads. We got the uh, copperhead. I just put copperhead down because I still like uh, uh, all the copperheads in Texas. Pretty much to me are the same species, but on this one you can see the the vertical uh, pupil. You can see the the pit the pit between the eyes and the nostril, and the pit. We only venomous uh, uh, vipers we have in the United States are, are pit vipers. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know how many people are bit by these in the U.S. There are quite a few people that are bit. My oldest son got bit by one, and uh, he was did not was not treated whatsoever. Uh, he just had to suffer for a, a few days, and and uh, and they watched him and monitored him, but uh, didn't even give him an anavine or anything. But he said it. He fe- said it felt like when he got bit. He felt like somebody slammed the, his fingers into a car door, and then somebody took a ball peen hammer and hit it real hard with the hammer. He said that's what the bite felt like. So, but it didn't move past his uh, el- the venom never did go past his uh, elbow area. It stayed pretty much in the lower part of his body. But it, and, the, and the next day they let him go. So, uh, yeah, there these are really common in your area. Uh, the, you got more or less the broadbanded copperhead in your area. They're very common. And when the cicadas start coming out in force, these guys will show up in force or in the, the, where the cicadas are coming up out of the ground to, to crawl out of their, uh, their old, their old uh, skin, you know, their old, uh, uh, I don't know, I can't remember what you call that, the nymph, yeah. But, uh, but getting bit is still very, very, very painful and can be dangerous. Uh, yeah, the molting before the, the cicadas molt. But they, they will eat them. I actually even observed that one time. But and especially in, in southeast Texas, where, where you got tremendous numbers in, in copperheads and cicadas, they will congregate around there. And they will even crawl up into the trees and, and eat, eat cicadas. But they'll eat other things too. They eat mice, they'll eat uh, you know, birds, they'll eat. I think they'll even eat other snakes, but uh, anyway, copperhead. Rattlesnakes, dimebacks are, yeah, the, the, I think they're still pretty abundant <laughs> throughout the state. Uh, it's dimeback rattlesnake. No, uh, I don't think there's been a, a real inc- increase in snake bites. We were talking about that the other day. Most of the people that get bit by these things nowadays, now there's the lady that my mother-in-law goes to the doctor. She got bit the other day at Kickapoo Cavern State Park, and she was just walking along a trail and got bit by, in the back of the leg. And uh, But that's the most people that, that get bit by these are guys that want to be macho and they want to either pin it and pick it up or they cut the head off and then pick the head up and, and it, then it's still with the reflexes and stuff bite them. But uh, just getting bit nowadays, you know, and then the safety thing about it too, it, a good sized snake, I'm trying to remember all this information, they can, uh, uh, it takes about 150 milligrams to, uh, uh, to kill an average sized person. And, but the thing is a diamondback can inject 300, twice that much. If with a full, you know, full bite, and of course they've got the the pit vipers have uh, uh, movable re, uh, things that that can move out and and really uh, uh, open up and 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 you know bite you like it's just straight on like a hypodermic will just hit you. They just got to hit you and, and with their mouth wide open and, and inject the venom into you. Whereas the, the coral snake has to literally bite you. 
more or less. Here's a close up of the head, the, the nostril. Down here is the pit. And the pit, yeah, uh, what's that say? I just missed it. <clears throat> that needs a flashing flasher on that thing when it comes up. Uh, the, the pit, uh, of course, is used for picking up heat. Again, the tongue, you know, they pick up the particles and bring it to the Jacobson organ. And the pit uh, can sense the heat differences. And so a pit viper can sit on a trail and uh, with a head sitting out toward facing out on the trail. And if something warm blooded comes by, it can pick up that sense uh, very easily. There was a guy that did research up in uh, uh, Colorado and he had a big water trough and he put the snake in the water trough and, uh, and he used uh, uh, warm balloons, the warm air balloons, and he'd move those things in front of the snake and that snake could hit that balloon every single time. So knowing, knowing it just by picking up the warmth, the heat from it. So these guys are, are ambush predators. They sit and wait for something to come by. And if it's a foot uh, right by them and you don't see them and they, they could hit the foot. And so that, that's the bad thing about it. You got to really watch out, you know, especially in, in most of the most of West Texas and where you're going and, and, you know, the hill country. And I think the hill uh, clean and, you know, all through Fort Hood, they're they're pretty common through there. So, anyway, the rattle, the uh, baby snakes still have a rattle. It's not a big rattle; it's just a button. And then every time they shed, they 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 have another uh, add another rattle to their to their uh, their tail. And uh, the reason you don't see a whole lot of them, a snake may shed either once or twice a year. And, uh, so, and if in captivity, they shed more often than that because you feed them more probably. Uh, but uh, they break off when they crawl out through rocks and stuff. All right, now here's another break time. Got questions. Here's a good time for questions. And, and, uh, and, and I don't know how much further you want me to go. <laughs> so. Thanks, Terry. This has been incredibly interesting. Um, uh, there's been a, just a lot of discussion. You have generated a lot of discussion. Yeah, I, saw, I, saw, I saw a lot of that stuff over there, but it disappears so quick, I can't see it. Oh, uh, it's you're you're in charge of presenting. I'm I'm watching all of that. Uh, but okay. you actually brought up something, and I want to see if you want to speak to it a little more. You did kind of go into it a bit when you had the uh, spot-tailed earless lizards yes. um, about yes. the conservation, and we as yeah. master naturalists, conservation is near to our heart in all sorts of right. species of plants and animals, and just either to that or to just um, reptiles and amphibians in general, uh, anything you want to add? Well, the, the, the thing about the spot-tailed earless lizard, the research they're doing right now is they're working with iNaturalists really closely. And uh, and anybody that reports one or finds one, they submit it to iNaturalists and they've gotten been able to develop a real, uh, a good series of maps of where these things have been found in recent years and in past years. And so right now they've got a project going where they want, want people to uh, even go back in their history and say, when was the last time you saw something or saw one of these lizards and, uh, and, and report it to our naturalists, even if it has not been reported recently, report some of the old sightings. And they don't even have to be uh, verified with photographs as much because they just want information. They want to see. And some of these may be, you know, uh, not truly spotted earless lizards that they're reporting, but usually you can tell by these reports and what, what they're doing and what they're reporting. Uh, they're trying to develop some uh, research protocols with these guys now to help be able to, to study them more fully or more uh, in depth. Um, uh, my son also worked on the, the, the sand dune lizard out in West Texas. He spent about four or five years of his life on that project. And uh, he, did, he said it didn't all come out nice and rosy on that one, but uh, but he did spend a lot of time out there on, on that that project, and then and then the state just drops it from the, the protected list. But anyway, that's a different story. Uh, but it does. It, there there are some uh, research being done. He's also doing research on a, a lizard in South Texas. And uh, they're doing uh, pro other projects. Uh, he's got a student right now that's doing research on uh, alligator lizards near Johnson City on the uh, 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 Bumgarner Ranch. 
Uh, and so he 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 specializes. He likes to specialize in lizards. But anyway, there's there's just a lot of different things that they're trying to find out what is necessary for this lizard to uh, exist. You know, to to keep uh, its its uh, existence on this planet. You know, and 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 not lose it. And uh, they've they've done they've probably done all the work they they can do on horn lizards pretty much. They know exactly a lot of stuff on that, um, but it's a uh, it's still something that is really limited in in our knowledge on on what what we need to do about these type of animals. You know, we've, golden cheek warblers have been studied probably to death. Black cap vireos have been studied to death. They know they know about those things really thoroughly and really know what they need and what they they don't need. But a lot of lizards and, and snakes, uh, they they just don't know uh, fully. And of course, I know with some comments here, you know, oh, you know, snakes, <laughs> snakes. I don't know. I'm going. I'm going to leave Texas. Too many snakes. <laughs> that kind of thing. But anyway. Um, All right. Well, good. But anyway, um, one quick. One quick question. It's funny between looking at my notes and looking at you, I did not realize you had a slide up on conservation. So you're fixing the talk. Yeah, about I've got, that. I've got, and this one is a, actually was designed by my son. Uh, and, and it was really special just for doing this at a, at a Texas National Natural Project over close to College Station. But uh, what I thought I might do is just talk about some of the, the uh, highlights of uh, things that the conservation needs and things we need to look at. Let's and do then, it. Then, 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 then we can close it up and, and shut it down. All right, let's do it. Is that, Good. Is that okay? Yes, indeed. <laughs> All right. So, one of the main things I know. Oops, I didn't intend to do that. One of the main things that uh, that's in the, the goals of the Texas National Naturalist when they study these things is is conservation. And um, let me move this, move this back to the other side now. Okay. Uh, things that we look at in, in conservation is uh, biodiversity loss. You know, the, the loss of biodiversity. Uh, when I taught school, I, I, I taught environmental science for a few years, and, and I you try to pound on these kids that biodiversity is very, very important. And when you go in and make your yard a uh, monoculture, you're losing biodiversity, and that that hurts the the overall picture of the uh, you know the, the plants and animals, other plants and animals that live there. Then we look at threatened and endangered and protected species in the state, uh, and you know the state has changed a lot of this stuff. But so you, you we'll have to I'll talk about that in a minute. And then there's a, a list of species of concern, and then what is being done. And, uh, and they've got deals about citizen science. And I think you guys have probably already had uh, information on citizen science projects uh, already. Uh, uh, Y'all had uh, our naturalists uh, uh, been brought to you and forth yes, to you? Yes, yes. We've had okay. some pretty so, big projects so already. Y'all had, had that program done to you already on the programs of science, uh, citizen science with eBird and, and uh, our naturalists and and now we got e e uh, uh, we got e butterflies we got dragonflies we just finished the Odenata uh, Central uh, uh, called the Old Olympics so there's a lot of programs in citizen science and and uh, y'all been over that so let's go on to the biodiversity here all right of course biodiversity is dealing with habitat destruction invasive species global climate climate change path pathogens uh, commercial collecting. And I'd say the probably the most important two right now in, in our minds is habitat destruction and global climate change uh, has been probably on the on the minds of people uh, more than anything else in the country right now. And, and at first, in in some areas of the state, uh, the country particularly. But anyway, habitat destruction. And I'm going to go through these really fast. You can see that you know that that's going to reduce the amount of biodiversity completely right there. Uh, and th look at this one. This is I've taken a picture of where my son did his research out on the sand dune lizards. This was taken in 1996, and this was taken in uh, 2011. Same spot. 
And you can see the different the ad, uh, addition of the oil wells out there and uh, kind of what happens to the sand dunes or where those lizards are found. And uh, so that, that just gives you a, a, an indication of what habitat destruction we're talking about. And then invasive species, we're going, like I said, we're going quick. In some parts of the country, bullfrogs, believe it or not, are an invasive species. Uh, in Arizona, they have a bullfrog kill every year at uh, uh, this big national uh, uh, wildlife refuge in South uh, Arizona. And uh, they, they go in and they try to kill as many bullfrogs as they can, and then they have a big bullfrog lay fry. But but these guys, if you recall, I've had, I had one of these that grab a, a, a shot dove that landed on a pond and go uh, uh, try to grab a, a dove. And here's one showing and gra had grabbed a bird that came down close to the, the water lilies. But anyway, so invasive. Now, other invasive species, there are other things too, uh, the Mediterranean gecko and there's some other uh, animals uh, that we are we're, uh, concerned with about that invasive species. Uh, in Texas, they're not as big a problem as they are in uh, Florida, invasive species. If you, any of you guys have been to Florida or read about some of the things that are going on in Florida with the pythons and the, there's a, a cobras, there's all kinds of stuff you can find in South Florida. Plants, plants are probably more invasive than the, any of the animals are. Uh, then you got pathogens. This is the, the fungus that, that is found on amphibians that can that causes this uh, 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 cit citrus fungus disease. And this thing is a very, very potent uh, killer to a lot of amphibians. And there's a lot of amphibians that carry the carry this uh, pathogen on their skin, but it doesn't affect them, but others it does. And so that's another big area of research going on right now is, is with the, this these guys, the, that would climate change. Now here, here, we don't know. We don't know what, the effects are right now is as much as we will, probably will in the future. The sad part about it, sometimes it may be too late. Things may have happened too late, and we say, "Oh, if we'd just done this, uh, you know, years ago, we would have uh, been okay." But you know, we don't we don't know. There's not enough research really going on right now to tell us what the effects are. If that heat spell, a uh, hot spell up in the northwest, is caused by climate change. You know, they say, well, it could be, could not be, it may not be, and it might be. So, you know, it's, 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 a lot of it is up in the air because they've just, there's, there's scientists that are doing research, but, you know, it's, it's just not, you know, we just don't know. We just don't know enough information about climate change, but it is something we really need to be concerned with. And then commercial collecting of China. This was found, this was photographed in China. China, the turtle soup is a big, big thing. And uh, China, the turtles in China are almost gone. In the other areas of Asia, the turtles are being gone. And now they're, they, they did import a lot of our turtles over there too. So uh, the commercial collecting of turtles is much more, I think, damaging to, to, the, to uh, wildlife than uh, the commercial collecting of some of the snakes and stuff for the pet trade, because this right here, I mean, they just thousands and thousands and thousands are slaughtered for their, their turtle dishes, their soups and whatever else they make out of turtles. But yeah, those are just some of the things we, we address. Um, a real quick, like in conservation in Texas, there, there are some problems we need to address in Texas. And uh, anyway, uh, just a few things here briefly. Um, problems, you know, what is, what is the biggest problem? It's population. Uh, Texas is a very, very fast growing state in, in population. And uh, the, the population centers are getting bigger and bigger and bigger and taking up more and more land. And, uh, and as that happens, uh, you know, it reduces our, our biodiversity. It, it reduces the, the, the animals that can live there. That's the reason Texas Master Nationalist is one of the reasons that, that it was established to help in these areas of concentration to people to realize that they can do things in their own yard to help in biodiversity. Problems. <laughs> 
this is a thing taken uh, uh, from after they were when they were doing the study on a sand dune lizard out in West Texas. Uh, big problems uh, with uh, with the the issues with people and with the the you know. Uh, businesses and stuff like that and you know the, this big lizard uh, this lizard this little tiny four inch lizard is causing havoc on everything that's going on in in, in the state and there, there was an article about that threat endangered species now like i said a lot of these have changed uh i'm not even going to go in over the list it just you need to go you can go to texas parks and wildlife and and go to their non-game species division and you can get a list of everything that is protected Everything that's uh, endangered, protected uh, uh, on the species of concern list, and all that kind of stuff. You can get all of those things in the, uh, going to Texas Parks and Wildlife in, on their website. And then you have uh, also they set up a program called Species of Concern, and some of these these animals have been taken off the list, and there have been a few things added to the list. My son has also been done some work on Western chicken turtle. And Texas, uh, Texas alligator snapping turtle. Now the chicken turtle has really got a star by it because that is some research is being done on that turtle right now. Uh, their populations seem to be going down. But then here recently, after they started doing study on the animal, they found out that they're not they're not as rare as they thought they were. They just only come up uh, to the surface certain times of year to reproduce and breed, and then they bury up in the mud the rest of the season. So. They're, they're, they found their, they put radios in some of them and they found them and um, found out where they went and what they did. <laughs> so it's interesting that once you get to be, be able to do some research on something, you find out. Alligator snapping turtles was the big problem with them was, was Louisiana. The laws of Louisiana, you know, alligator snapping turtles are good to eat and they're big and you get a lot of meat on them. And uh, so they were coming across into Texas and, and uh, trapping them and bringing them back to their state where they had uh, over trapped them over there. And so they put laws against that. Uh, this guy is okay. Their spot tail earless lizard, uh, like I said, they're starting to do a lot of research on those. They found out the South Texas farm is only about three populations left out of uh, dozens in the past, but the ones out in the Western edge of the Edwards Plateau seem to be doing much, much better. Uh, there's the doom sand, but Louisiana pine snake is one that really hurts my hurts my heart more than anything else. Uh, they haven't found a Louisiana pine snake probably in Texas in the last 10 to 15 years. Um, they've got traps set out. They've got uh, 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 cameras uh, set out. My, they have a these the traps set up where you got a trap camera a camera and they have to funnel th through this spot to get through it and um, they've had those traps set up and they'll take uh, oh millions of pictures with that and they they still have not found any of these in texas there's still a population in louisiana apparently but that's it they like open pine grassland forest like the old longleaf pine forest used to be you don't find it anymore anyway uh real grand these are just some of the animals that are being uh, studied uh, that's the whoop let me go backwards again uh, previous previous this is that spot tail earless lizard again to find out th these guys we found a road over by Brackettville one summer every time you went on that road you'd find four or five on that sunny and basking along the road the next year zero the next year, zero. The next year, zero. So we don't know exactly what the deal is going on because one year you'll find a bunch and, and then you won't see them for several years. So that's the reason they're trying to figure out what's going on with this lizard. Uh, this is a reticulated collar lizard. It's found in South Texas and it's one that has uh, been diminished because of uh, agricultural practices down there. Uh, a bunch of grasses that have been planted on a lot of ranches and stuff, and they can't run through that stuff very well. They like uh, open trails and, and open areas that they run between clumps of grass or vegetation. But uh, they're really a neat lizard. They've pretty much finished done it, studying those. Uh, Desert Massasauga, which is a venomous snake. It's a poison, uh, not poisonous. I don't use poisonous ever. Try not to, but sometimes it slips out. Venomous snake. And uh, anyway, uh, their their uh, their numbers have been going down, down, down in Texas as well. Okay, I don't want to go into that. 
Um, okay, but anyway, this is what I was talking about. What I National Senate can do, and y'all, y'all is doing this. This was a map generated through I Naturalist, and uh, uh, the, some of these are, are these are records, uh, locality records from ever that's ever been posted on uh, on I Naturalist and also uh, uh, other sources. And then uh, then you look at them today. Here and you compare them. Here's the little lot population down here in South Texas that's not, that still exists. And here's a few over here by uh, uh, Air Force Base in uh, Del Rio that exists. And then you got this population up here that's still in pretty good shape. So you can see what how important uh, logging this stuff on our naturalists and other sources is to let people know exactly what was and now what is. Okay, so what are the, our threats to, to, to our environment today? Buffalo grass was a big threat to the horn lizard, and it's also a threat to quail. Uh, you have a, the, the just pastures of this thick, thick buffalo grass that nothing can penetrate through it hardly at all. Quail doesn't like it, and certainly lizards don't like it. Of course, roads, squashed lizard on the road. There's a, one of his spot-tailed earless lizards that got smashed on the road. And then, and of course, agriculture, too. But they have found that the spot-tailed eagles lizard down in South Texas favors some of the agricultural areas. So that's interesting. So uh, other animals that have been declining and they haven't put on the list is things we got questions about. Texas garter snake, prairie skink, of course, horn lizards, which has been on the list for years, and some other animals that we we're, we're have concern with. There are a list that we can come up with and talk about that said, if you had not seen them in a long time, that we we have we have uh, some issues. We're trying to figure out what's going on, and those are the programs y'all have already done. All right, now questions. I had a question while ago myself. How many of you guys did y'all say you saw have seen a a, a cotton lizard in your area recently? Anybody? Did anybody answer that? <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, I don't know if anybody answered that or not, but well, uh, if anybody did, we'll we'll get yeah, you contact information. To give you contact information. But yeah, that was quick going through the conservation stuff because I know some of that some of that y'all have had before, and uh, but some of it is like a you, uh, it's a whole course just going into that pretty much, but and uh, and going into detail on some of those aspects, but. Uh, Hopefully, uh, you got a little bit of information about reptiles and amphibians, and hopefully, uh, you know, it'll be beneficial. This is not as much fun as doing it live in front of you guys over there in Temple, though. <laughs> That's a whole lot more fun. Yes, and uh, <laughs> when you bring when you bring show and tell, we enjoy that as well. <laughs> Well, I so, thought about showing something here, but that's it's not the same. It's not the same. <laughs> it's not the All same. All right. Well, Terry, thank you so much. That was a lot of information. You have great photos uh, to kind of demonstrate the variety and the similarities that we have uh, with different wildlife here in Texas. And we appreciate yeah. your efforts very much. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Marianne to uh, okay. wrap us out. Okay.